Okay. Um, welcome to the Amherst Jeff, Planning Board. Jeff, can you wait? Can you hold on just a second? I'm not seeing Amherst Media. Oh, okay. They did acknowledge my um, sending them an agenda last week. So hopefully yeah, they had they had told me they were here. There they are. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Jack. You're good. Okay. To go. Now we can go. All right. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of June 30th, 2021. My name is Jack Jemsek and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, include, uh, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. Members of the public who wish to Access the meeting may do so by following the link down shown on the slide. This link is also available on the meeting agenda posted on the town's website calendar listing for this meeting, or you can go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public will be permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the Town of Amherst website an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Board members, I will take a roll call when I call your name, unmute yourself, answer firmly, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow? Here. Tom Long? Here. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. And Johanna Newman. Here. And then uh, Andrew McDougall uh, has called, well, notified us, he, he is uh, out. Uh, so board members, if technical issues arise, please let Pam know if necessary. We may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if this happened. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during a uh, general public comment period. Please indicate if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting as a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views up for, for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. And Pam, I see we have no minutes, correct? That is correct. Okay, and uh, at this time we can uh, open up to public comment period. I see one hand up, Pam Rooney, and then Dorothy Pam. So Pam Rooney, uh, state your name and uh, address, please. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Um, for the record, I would just like to register my unhappiness at the process, uh, which three zoning amendments ended up directly to the town council for a vote on referral. Um, I'm going to borrow a phrase coined by my former supervisor, which is, that is a process foul. And I think it was a huge surprise to have heard following at your, your June 16 meeting, the, the in-depth discussion that you had about uh, mixed use building definition, and at which point uh, there was some consideration, it was certainly not a done deal. One, one um, planning board member said that it didn't seem that it was ready to go forward to the town council. And that is exactly where the public was left at the conclusion of the planning board meeting. Uh, the other two amendments never even got discussed that night. So I can only speak for myself and for the public that it was a complete surprise and pretty disturbing 
that the planning board, I have the planning department, excuse me, and according to, to uh, Mr. Bockelman, uh, that there in, apparently is opportunity for them to directly send material to the town council for uh, a vote on referral. Um, I, I just think, I think it puts you, the planning board, completely out of that loop. And it was, uh, it appeared to me to be extremely disrespectful to you as a board to have not have had the opportunity to discuss and formulate your opinions about those three zoning amendments. And I am very disappointed. Thank you. Um, just for clarification, uh, Chris, uh, I wasn't, can you kind of follow up that with, cause I, you know, I was at the town council for a bit, but what, what happened? Uh, so, um, Things have changed from the way they used to be. And the way they used to be was that most um, zoning amendments originated with the planning board and the planning board and the zoning subcommittee would work on them for a while and then present them as um, potential zoning amendments. And then um, the planning board would decide when it wanted to hold a public hearing. The select board had a role, but it was a minor role in um, learning about the amendments and then um, referring them to the planning board for a public hearing. Um, that has changed and the CRC is taking a much more active role now than um, had been taken in the past by the select board in the development of zoning amendments. And the planning board, I believe was well aware that there was a mixed use building uh, zoning amendment and an apartments zoning amendment that were being worked on. Uh, we did bring it to the CRC and they thought it was those amendments were ready to go to um, town council. Um, the planning board did set aside a, a separate night, which is July 14th to talk about zoning amendments. And the planning board will be holding a public hearing with the CRC on July 21st on four zoning amendments, mixed use buildings, apartments, um, parking th that has to do with mixed use buildings and apartments and accessory dwelling units. So those four um, public hearings will be coming to the planning board on July 21st. They will be joint meetings with the CRC. And that is um, just the way that things seem to be working now. Um, so it's a change from the past, and I understand that that's difficult for people to, um, to what, I don't know, understand, tolerate, whatever. But that's, that's kind of my explanation for things. So the planning board will certainly have at least two more opportunities to talk about these on July 14th, and again at the public hearing on July 21st. Okay, thanks. I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, so um, we have. Uh, I don't, Dorothy. I don't think, I'm sorry, I don't think any of the planning board was aware of that. Um, I wonder if we could talk about it under um, old business, because um, it's not the procedure that we agreed to with the CRC. Um, you know, the flow chart that was adopted by the CRC on May 6 last year. And I'm, I'm personally completely taken aback what happened at the town council that we weren't even informed that these amendments were going to them. I, I don't understand that. So I'd like to talk to about, about that under old business or new business. I, mean, I don't know what else is, is anything else coming? Yeah, just, this is, I'm we're, we're gonna be focused on uh, archipelago, but uh, we will do that, Janet. Uh, so let's, okay. we have uh, Dorothy Pam, Pam Rooney, and then uh, Susanna Mouse Pratt. So Dorothy, state your name and address, thank you. me? Yes. Okay, great. Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. And um, I am now speaking as a town counselor. Um, I'm a member of CRC. I attend the planning board meetings. I was as shocked as any of you at what happened. It was, to me, it was a complete power grab. Um, CRC has hijacked the process, and I think that our zoning is now illegitimate. Um, the public process 
is totally broken. People come, we talk, you debate, you have ideas. And then in the dark of the night, things are snatched off the table and presented to the town council without much preparation. And all of the things that you spent months talking about, you know, setbacks, public sp uh, space, um, height restrictions, some, some sense of this, these buildings belong in the community, the town of Amherst, all of that disappeared. And there's just this little line that says some design specifications, nothing spelled out. So I, I, am, I, am, I am outraged. Um, I, am, I am on CRC, but let's just say I am the vote against it. Um, it's a staff committee and I, I agree completely with Janet. This is not the process. Remember that chart and all the colors and many of you were taken aback. What is this? Okay, that Byzantine chart, that isn't being followed. It was just an obfuscation device to make you think there was a process that you were a part of. So I, I would like to see the planning board, which has you, I believe the planning board is empowered by the state to do things. Okay, I, I mean, you have powers. And the planning department, I would like to see you take back your powers. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, uh, let, let's go to Susanna first and then, and then back to Pam. State Hi, your name Susanna. and address. Thank you. Hello, Susanna Muspret, 38 North Prospect. And while we're talking about the process, I'm also uh, still concerned about the community impact assessment, which on the chart is shown as CRC's responsibility. It was to be prepared to inform the planning board's discussion of zoning amendments. Uh, I have not seen hide nor hair of any such document. I don't know if you have, but if it exists, it should be made public and not only should it state the CRC's conclusions, but it should also outline the process they followed, the various constituents they talked to in formulating their assessments and how they arrived at their conclusions. This is part of the process that CRC wrote and it hasn't happened to the best of my knowledge and I hope if you have those documents, you will see that they get made public. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, and <laughs> Pam Rooney, please. Hi, Pam. Hi again, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I'd like to refute what uh, Director Brestrup said. And my, my, one of my main points is that the public who bothered to come to the 616 saw no conclusion and no wrap up of any of the amendments. And yet, and yet it was portrayed to the town council that there had been some minor discussion uh, and some and a little bit of uh, back and forth on, on the topics, but that the one member who had actually spoken out against, uh, you know, and said it wasn't ready had been pulled aside and and was explained, the, the thing was explained. My, my concern and my point is that was not a public process. The public was left thinking that you, the planning board would be back to talk about these things. It is where we would normally go to hear those conversations and they sure as heck did not happen. It went straight to the town council. And I think, I think there should have been from the planning department at least a notification that you were going to be intending to push it forward to the town council anyway, whether or not the planning board discussed it that night, that would have been the appropriate and public thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, um, we have continuation of, uh, of four hearings. I'm gonna just go over them briefly. Uh, then Chris is going to uh, speak, you know, further introductory comments, and then I'll read the preamble. So um, SPP 2021-03 is by Archipelago. All these are Archipelago. Um, all pertain to, well, no, okay. Um, the first one's 1113 East Pleasant Street, and it's continued from the June 2nd meeting. So they're requesting a special permit for a non-conforming building to be structurally altered 
enlarged or reconstructed under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw for a mixed use building proposed under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw. And the, the, the second hearing is SPR 2021-07 and SPP 2021-02, uh, also by Archipelago at 11 East Pleasant Street, continued from May 5th and June 2nd, 2021. Joint public hearing to request site plan review approval for construction of a mixed use building containing dwelling units in combination with ground floor retail and commercial, uh, including approximately 1300 square feet of retail space, lobby, leasing, fitness, trash area, mechanical space, elevator, parking, and 55 apartments under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw, and to request a special permit to modify dimensional requirements for height, side, and rear setback under footnote A of table three, section six of the zoning bylaw. And the third hearing is, SPR 2021-09 from Archipelago for 15 East Pleasant Street, continued from May 5th and June 2nd, 2021, requesting a site plan review approval under section 5.00 of the zoning bylaw for an accessory and incidental use to a permit, uh, permitted principal use on an adjacent lot for construction staging and management of 11 East Pleasant Street project. Post-construction, uh, uh, site will be stabilized with asphalt surface and fenced. And the fourth is SPR 2021-12 by Archipelago for 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. Excuse me, oh. Jack. Yes. Do you want to open this fourth public hearing and then they'll all be open? Oh, this is not a, a continuation. This is not a continuation. This okay. is a new one. Yeah. Well, do you want us, do you want us, um, that would be with the preamble? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let me do that. And then you can speak. All right, thanks. All right. So, and now to open the fourth hearing, um, again, it's a SPR 2021-12 Archipelago Investments LLC for 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna let you cover some details there, Chris. Um, and it's, 650, uh, so we can go ahead and proceed with this. In accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2021-12 Archipelago Investments LLC for 1113 East and Pleasant Street. Public hearing for site plan review application for construction of a mixed use building containing dwelling units in combination with ground floor retail and commercial, including approximately 2,200 square feet of retail space, lobby, leasing, fitness, trash area, mechanical space, elevator, and 90 apartments, including 11 affordable units under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw. And any board member disclosures? I see none. Um, and um, Chris, would you like to further introduce introduce these? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to make a statement because this seems very confusing. There are so many uh, applications um, and now applications that are open and I wanted to put them in context. So I'm Chris Brester, planning director, and um, just wanted to make some explanation. The applicant is proposing a mixed use building in the general business zoning district. This use and type of building is allowed by site plan review with the planning board under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw. The applicant has filed three site plan review applications. The first is site plan review 202107, which is for a five story mixed use building with parking on the ground floor and retail and 55 apartments. And that's going to be located at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. The second is SPR 202109, and this is for uh, a use that's accessory to and incidental to the construction on the next door property. And the reason for this application is to give the planning board control over what goes on there. And the, the applicant is proposing to stage materials and provide access to the building, to the building site at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. 
Um, and the third site plan review application, which was recently received, the most recently received is for a five-story mixed use building with no parking, with retail on the ground floor that's larger than what was first proposed and with 90 apartments, 11 of which are proposed to be affordable. The first site plan review application was reviewed by the planning board at its May 5th public hearing. At that time, the board had many questions and comments. At the same time, the applicant became aware of the pending inclusionary zoning bylaw amendment that would require the provision of affordable dwelling units for most residential developments. So the applicant has submitted a new site plan review application, which includes affordable units. The public hearings for the first site plan review application public hearing, excuse me, was continued to June 2nd, at which time the planning board did not take any testimony, but continued the public hearing to June 30th. In addition, the applicant has requested special permits. Two of them are for dimensional modifications under footnote A of table three of the zoning bylaw, which is in section six. And that special permit, one of them is for side setback and for height. The other special permit is under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw, which is for alteration, enlargement, or reconstruction of a non-conforming building. There's already a non-conforming building on the site and the applicant is contending that um, he, will, he would like to take advantage of the non-conformity that the existing building has and use that non-conformity to allow the new building to be closer to the rear property line than would normally be allowed. So the public hearing for the first special permit was opened on May 5th and continued to June 2nd. On June 2nd, the public hearing for the second special permit was opened and both public hearings for special permits were continued to June 30th. So tonight you're considering all five of these applications and perhaps you'd like to ask the uh, applicant which um, site plan review applications you application you should be focusing on Maybe he'll give you some uh, direction as to um, which one to focus on, or perhaps he wants to focus on both of them. So that's what I had to say. I just wanted to kind of put this in context because there are a lot of moving parts here. Thank you. Thank you for that. So with that said, um, we already had a, a site visit, um, but the applicant can definitely present and kind of clarify uh, what's moving forward. Uh, it doesn't sound like everything can move forward here. Um, so Kyle Wilson and David Williams of Archipelago and Mark Bobrowski, is he on your team? Mark's our attorney, yet. Yeah. Oh, attorney, okay. He should probably be on mute most of the time. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are presenting, and I think we should focus on the most recent Submittal site plan review, which is for uh, the building that has 90 apartments, um, 11 of which are affordable. Um, so I think that our presentation tonight was just to review that, review the latest submittal, review the drawing, any changes between what we presented previously, and um, try to answer any questions that may come up. So I would defer to you if you'd like me to get into that, or if you'd like me to wait and and have well, some more are, conversation. Are you going to withdraw the SPR 2021-07 or how's um it's it's my understanding that they will remain open and that we're taking action on the most recent. I see. Okay. Yeah, so uh, um do you uh Pam, do you have a PowerPoint for them or how, how are you proceeding, Kyle? I, I, I defer to you. If you guys want me to just jump in and grab the screen and, and yes. go through the latest, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that. please. Okay. Let's see if I can pull that off here. Oh, 
I guess. Get in there. Are we in there? I see your it's... desktop. Okay, here we go, good. So I'll start with the architectural. Uh, so let's see if I can get rid of that. Okay. So uh, the architectural set is very similar to the set we submitted previously. Uh, overall, the footprint of the building almost is identical. Uh, the only change is that there's an increase in the setback that we've proposed for the um, cemetery uh, setback. This is uh, the rendering from Kendrick Park. Um, this is the site plan. Um, the site plan, the revised site plan will show you a couple of things. Um, it shows that the building has been pulled back from five feet to 10 feet at the cemetery property line. It shows that we have removed the propane from the place where uh, the existing building is currently on the south side. It shows that we've continued the planting along the cemetery side and wrapped the building. Um, it shows the extension of bollards along the property line um, uh, further to the east um, and also shows that other than that, not much uh, has changed. Uh, the coverages, um, building and site, <clears throat> I'm sorry, lot and building have been revised slightly, both slightly less because the building has gotten slightly smaller to go from a five foot setback to a 10 foot setback. Um, the first floor plan um, is where the biggest changes have occurred on the building. Uh, we have removed the parking. We have introduced additional apartments. We have revised the apartment mix uh, to 90 apartments total. There are studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms exclusively. There's 30 studios, there's 36 one bedrooms, and there's 24 two beds. Um, you'll see those spread out over the different plans over the next five floors. We have six apartments that are now on the ground floor. Uh, we have increased the size of the retail um, around the south to occupy that whole head of the building. Um, we've kept the stair and the elevator as they were to make the egress work on the hallways upstairs. We've got an increased back of house for that retail. So combined, they're 2,200 square feet, roughly. Um, we've extended the lobby uh, and brought the residential entry into that point, uh, kept fitness about where it is, and then brought the property management storage, electrical, hot water, trash, and service onto the north side of the ground floor. Um, so again, uh, these there will be six apartments that are brought onto the ground floor. Um, the parking has been removed. Uh, retail has gotten larger. Setback has been increased on the cemetery. Bollards have been increased down the north side. Um, and the lobby extends across connecting the head and the tail of the building, if you will. Uh, the upper floors show the breakdown of the units. Studios ones and twos spread out um, around the stairs, around the elevator, around the trash and electrical and, and so on, um, working with codes to, to make these work. The two bedrooms occupy the corners. Studios and ones are, um, are spread out uh, in between. All five of the floors are essentially identical. This section here at, uh, at the cut or the gash changes a little bit on floor to floor, but the units mm -hmm. remain the same. Uh, this is the fifth floor on the previous fifth floor plan. This was a resident space. This has been changed into a unit. Um, and you can see the, the units as they break down on a four by four basis. This is the roof plan. Um, a couple of changes to the roof plan. We brought up a, a room on the roof that will house the generator. Um, mm -hmm. And that room will, uh, we've used that to assist with breaking down the scale of that north elevation somewhat, um, shifted the, side, the location of the trash room and the trash chute has shifted. Otherwise, most of that has remained identical. Um, the elevations have altered slightly, but not much uh, to accommodate the new units. Um, spent a bunch of time to try to get these to work with the revised layout. Um, the head of the building on the street side has not changed at all. Um, the north side has changed. You can see the bollards extending. You can see the new doors from the ground floor. 
Uh, you can see the, the change in the elevation to accommodate the different units. You can see how we've tried to highlight the uh, stairwell uh, on the new layout to kind of break up that facade and give a tripartite uh, division on that. Um, a little different integration of the zinc uh, access paneling on that east side of the north elevation to further break that up. Uh, you can also see the grade on the cemetery side um, as we've, I'll show you on the civil that has been increased to get closer to the existing west cemetery grade and the trees that are coming along around on that east side. Um, you can see here the cemetery side with the tree planting. I don't know why I keep doing that, but, um, and the grade that has gotten higher as we pull the building away from the cemetery. And you can see on the bottom, the south elevation that shows the apartment unit windows on the ground floor, shows the trees along the south side. Um, and um, uh, some slight revisions to the fitness and the leasing. The renderings stay the same. The renderings haven't changed effectively because the building has not changed very much. So these views from the street and from Halleck remain the same. Uh, the view of the detailing and the construction methodology and the materiality all remain the same. Uh, the gash and the zinc and the cedar and the Julia balconies remain the same as well as the, the, the brick and the bollards and all of the materials remain the same. Um, I'll show you the updated landscape. This is the updated landscape plan. Um, again, this is the ground floor plan that sh shows the larger retail that wraps around, shows the apartments on the ground floor facing south, shows the trees that extend south and now extend up. Um, we've eliminated the propane. Uh, we're gonna try to make this building all electric. Uh, the <laughs> biggest hurdle to that is hot water. There's some new technology with electric heat pump hot water and the electrification of buildings that we think we can achieve and um, get rid of fossil fuels completely except for the generator, which we hope to use existing Berkshire gas, uh, uh, gas for. Um, but this is the updated uh, landscape plan um, that shows the Armstrong maples, the red twig dogwood. Um, and uh, as you'll notice, this is not a place that is a circular path. There's not gonna be circulation that's gonna be um, uh, fostered uh, in this location. Uh, with the residential apartments on the ground floor, we wanted to make that more of a, a dead end, more of a view mm -hmm. corridor. So you can see from the street, you can see West Cemetery, which you can't see right now because the Piper building, but you'll be able to, it will not be a place to gather outside of the apartments. Um, I'll show you quickly the revised Sybil. Um, this is existing. Let me focus in on this a little bit because it will help with the grading, which I think is, is a question. So you can see here on, on SVE's plan that we have uh, a grade that we're trying to accommodate that will rise and fall on the backside along the cemetery. So you'll see in photos tonight um, that there's a big grade change up to five feet between the cemetery and the, and the building. Um, by pulling the building back to 10 feet, we're gonna backfill in there and try to get a higher, try to get up closer to the historic height of the landscape at West Cemetery and uh, elevate it from the current uh, uh, grading that is the top of asphalt um, that's right on the property there. Um, other than that, you can see the prop, the uh, transformer, the, the uh, propane is gone. The drywall remains because that's where the grade is and that's where the water from the cemetery will continue to run through the site. So we wanna catch that there. Um, all the utilities are on the north side at this point um, by getting propane out of there. Um, in meeting with Western Mass Electric about uh, the transformer and electricity, uh, it's been determined that the existing transformer that is in the right of way that is eased by Eversource that went in as part of the burial of the power lines for uh, the east side of Kendrick Park uh, has the capacity with a new transformer to serve the needs here. Um, so we would not need to put a new transformer on the site. Uh, in doing so, we'd also, there's currently an existing little plastic light green doghouse that's next to the transformer that would be eliminated and that would go away. So the um, infrastructure the, it gets a little bit easier, gets a little more refined. Um, like I said, we got rid of the propane. And then what we've also shown here is a crosswalk. Um, that crosswalk has, there's been additional surveying that's been done. Um, that crosswalk recognizes the reality of the Eversource equipment that is on the west side of Pleasant, East Pleasant Street there. 
um, uh, proposes a location that uh, uh, hopefully works for uh, DPW and the town engineer, which I trust that it would, um, and would, um, I think, uh, get us to a, locate, a situation where we would uh, resolve the pedestrian crossing between uh, across Pleasant Street here that otherwise only occurs just north of here on Prairie Street. Um, and I think I will go back to this if I will, if I could, and um, uh, try to, I guess, take some questions from here. Okay. Um, the one piece in our packet that you didn't address as a historical commission is that something, um, Chris? Chris Brestrip is. Do um, you want me to talk about that? If you're able to. So, um, Mr. Wilson met with the historical commission, um, I think it was June 23rd, and they discussed um, the impact. They were focused on what the impact to the West Cemetery would be of this new building. Um, they acknowledged that most of the trees along the property line would come down as a result of this um, new building going in. However, they requested that the two trees towards the south, um, which are in pretty good shape and they're on town property, and I believe they're both maple trees, that those two be um, preserved. Um, the Historical Commission, with advice from um, Alan Snow, the tree warden, um, has talked about moving the fence down to the property line. The fence currently is not on the property line. It's um, the property line is about halfway down that slope that you see in this picture. So um, in order to be able to better maintain the edge of the property, um, the tree warden and the historical commission would like to have that fence moved to where the property line is so that the town would be uh, fully in control of the town's property and part of the town's property wouldn't be on um, Archipelago's property. Um, they asked that no trees be planted on the Archipelago side of the property line, but that Archipelago um, help the town to plant trees on the cemetery side of the property line because they thought um, you know they'd, they'd be better situated there they the sim the historical commission wants to have trees on their side of the property line and they felt that it would be too much to have two rows of trees back there um what else did they say um i think that about oh. covers it uh, they acknowledge yeah, I, the fact that there would be a grade change back here. I, um, I was confused by the one line there. Uh, says a strong preference for a minimum 10 foot setback. So they, the they acknowledge that the required setback is 20 feet. Um, they acknowledge that the previously proposed setback was, was five feet and they didn't want to have a five foot setback. That's the setback that was proposed to you on May 5th. Um, and so they are willing to go along with a 10 foot setback, but they would prefer a 20 foot setback. That's, that was the gist of that comment. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I will open it up to questions from the board. Um, I'll reserve comment for now. Um, Do you want me to hop off guys, the screen share? Does you have a property, you have a preference? Oh, no, no, you stay. Yeah, we're going to okay. need you to answer questions, I'm sure. Okay. So, uh, anybody want to start? Doug? Well, thanks, Jack, and thanks, Kyle, for coming back. Um, I guess I, my first question is Am I correct that this revised building is a direct response to the what appears to be an imminent new bylaw that uh, contains the inclusionary zoning. Uh, this, this revised proposal uh, reflects a project that we've been working on for many years and, a, um, and our attempt to uh, be able to continue to proceed with that project. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that 
that answer. Um, okay, then I'll just say for the record that I, I think this is a direct response to the inclusionary housing. Um, and I think the that's pretty clear because um, by making the changes to the floor plan you've made, you've increased substantially increased the number of units. And since the inclusionary housing bylaw is likely to be to require a percentage of the units to be uh, affordable by reducing the size of the typical unit and probably not changing the number of beds appreciably, uh, you've, you've reduced the number of beds that are likely to be, have to be affordable. Okay, so that said, um, Doug, Jack, I, would, I have I would, a, an initial question Doug, for you. Just, I'm sorry. Just, just quickly, Doug, I, yep. I would, I would, I would, I think that some of the math on that might be off. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I think that you're making some assumptions. I think that the uh, number of residents you can see from the previous application to the current has gone down. Okay. Um, and the um, the attempt to balance uh, everything you need to balance on uh, on a new project is what we tried to pull off here. So the changing the very quick redesign of the building, which included a change of units, yeah. um, is a global response to, you know, the entitlement realities that we have before us and the housing market that we see. Okay. Uh, for just for clear, I'm sorry, Doug, but just for clarification with the number of residents, uh, what's the change between the two designs? I believe it was a hundred and, let me look here. I believe it went from 140-ish to 120-ish. I'd get the exact number. Okay. Uh, sorry, Doug. Uh, no, that's that's uh -huh. fine. And thanks, Kyle, for pointing that out. Um, I think my observation was mostly based on the elimination of the four-bedroom unit, and um, you know, the, having those replaced with mostly one and two-bedroom units. So uh, I guess my first question is of the, for the 11 affordable units, how many are, do you know at this point, how many are proposed to be 80% AMI and how many would be 60% AMI? Yes, uh, there'd be nine at 80 and two at 60. All right. And we've got uh, the numbers again are 30 studios and 36 one bedrooms. So that's the majority of the building. And then we've got 24 two bedrooms. And the allocation of the 11 is proportionate to the unit. So okay. there's four studios, four one beds, and three two beds. Okay. Thank and then you. the 60% are the two that are four. So there's a 60% studio and a 60% one uh -huh. bed. Uh huh. All right. Okay, then Jack, um, I noticed in Chris's development application report that there were numerous uh, locations where Chris was recommending that the board ask about certain things. Um, do we have a structured way for going through that, those recommendations, or do one of us need to um, lead that discussion. Doug, I welcome you to, to uh, take the lead on that. If you, if you were up to it. Um, is that okay, Doug? You, can you, you, you want to proceed with that? I wonder if Jack's, like. oh, there he is, he's back. Oh, I, I, so I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, uh, I froze up there for a while. Okay. So I invite you to go ahead and, and uh, address that because that'd be great. Okay, uh, well, I, mean, I, I, you know, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Um, but, uh, okay, so, yeah. so I, I'll just go through uh, the items that it looked like Chris was, was making, you know, recommending that we made, make sure we're brought up. 
as long as my internet connection is stable here. All right. Um, all right, starting on page four of Chris's development application report. Um, first one is about the outdoor space in front of the building. Um, Kyle, I wondered if you could talk about the vision for the use of that space, whether it's just circulation or whether it's likely to be a place that people linger in. Uh, the in oh, I just sorry. interrupt. Uh, Doug, were, were you, I don't see that in my, my packet. Is it? Well, I have a the, paper the packet. The, oh, you have a paper packet. Oh, okay. So we have 47 pages. I think have, I sent it to you after the um, after Pam sent out oh, the packet. Oh, okay. I Here sent a separate development right. application report because I didn't get it in, done in time. Okay. Sent it with Pam's packet. All right. My, my apologies. All right. But I think it was sent on Friday if you're looking for it in your email. Yeah, I'm all clear now. Thank you. All right. Thanks. And Kyle? Doug, so to your question, this uh, this area here, which is recessed under the building, uh, there's an entry to the retail here and an entry to the retail here. So there obviously be circulation that goes through there. Yep. It's also trying, this helps us reconcile the grade because this does drop a, a bit from north to south. And we have to have all the water and egress and everything work all the way around. Um, so, and then this bench right here is seat height. So that, that, that site wall is the height of a bench. So okay. seating would take place here and then seating would take place back here as you're coming into outside of the leasing office. All right, so the site wall uh, at the back of the entry there, the second one you pointed out, that would also serve to discourage people from walking beyond it. Correct. Yeah, that's a bench here. This is a site wall. Um, obviously, somebody can jump up here and run through the dogwoods if they want to, but it'll be discouraged. Okay. All right. Then the second item, um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the mechanical equipment on the roof and the, the height of the, para, the parapet. So, uh, Doug, let me interrupt you uh, one time. Uh, I saw Janet's hand. Is this with reference to the former question, Janet? Yeah, so I, I'm wondering um, if it might make some, if the board might want to talk about this whole front section and how it would work. I mean, if Doug, Doug could go through Christine's list and we can come back and talk about this again, but I'm wondering um, if we're talking about this area, because I had a bunch of questions. I didn't really understand how it would work or who it works for. And I wonder if it's just, maybe you could take a moment and just stick on this subject for a bit and get a better sense of it. Or sure. do you want, does that make sense? Okay. Um, um, I did have a question. I didn't understand um, what this other courtyard was for where it says pavers and there's like a little shape in the middle. Like, was that for the tenants to hang out in or was that for members of the public or like what? Because I, I think I rec I think this is new. This here? Yeah. Uh, so this this is existing. The newness is the is the you know is the storefront that would go across here to create the enclosure for the lobby. So the intent here is this is the residential entrance to the 90 apartments above that would be used the majority of the time on the south side. So you picture people coming in, going down um, from the um, south side, coming in, walking into this kind of wider area, and going into the lobby. Yeah. So if, if, if you're coming back and you're going into your apartment and you're coming from the north, you come down here, you duck around here, you come past the piece of granite that's set in the pavers and you come in the lobby right here. And so on the north side where there's kind of a narrow five foot walkway with bollards, who's that for? And what I mean, it seems. Uh, we wanted to have access on both sides. Right. We wanted to make sure that that stayed. There was some pedestrian activity on that north side, so we do have a door. So there will be key card access at that at the north door and the south door. Um, and so anybody that wants to come through here can, if you're coming from the north, you could come walk in and come into the lobby on this side as well. So, so when I look at um, One East Pleasant Street, and there is a very similar card corridor with bollards on the north side, it looks really narrow to me. And it would be difficult for two people to pass, maybe people carrying bags, somebody with a stroller or, you know, 
in the winter, there might be some snow. And so when I look at One East Pleasant, that looks like, that looks too narrow to me. And so my, one of my suggestions would to make, to make that wider. Um, so at least people can pass comfortably. Um, and so that, so that, that corridor. And so do you see this space around the granite block as recreational space for the tenants or just kind of a walkthrough space? Cause I wonder if you can make it. I think they could do whatever they, you know, I don't, I don't, I haven't programmed it beyond. Yeah. Beyond so, cause it, to me, it seems like the front of the building still lacks any kind of um, public amenity feel interaction um, because it, it just doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't seem inviting. And I wonder if you could combine those two spaces, you know, have more space in front of the building, pull the building back a little bit, or at least orient it more, like maybe slant it a little bit so there's not such a tight um, point at the um, northwest corner. And that way you would have, you know, a place that is for public, you could have some amenities and benches, there's more room for trees, and that would fix, fit the streetscape um, really everywhere downtown. Um, and then you could have a mixing of the tenants and people using the, you know, going to the store or people just stopping to chat. And so, and that also fits what, you know, two of our criteria for site plan review and special permit. And so it's some outdoor space for the tenants, it's interactive space for the public, it's an amenity. And so I, to me, just that little courtyard, just thought, you know, are people gonna really use that? Probably not. Why not put that in the front and make it more for everybody? I wonder what other well, well, members I, need. I, I, just my, my comment on that is that, you know, as we've stated previously, um, you know, our BG district is extremely small in our town. It's less than one half of 1% of our total land mass. Um, it's very precious. We have to try to deal with the housing crisis that we have and provide housing. Um, we've provided two ways of egress to the lobby. One that is plenty wide for multiple people to, there's an access way to the retail. There's access to the lobby. People will commingle. There'll be outdoor space. There's places to people gather under cover in inclement weather. We've also added another door to the north side that gives another egress option. So I don't think we're, I don't think re continuing to reduce the size of the building in this very unique site is is um, uh, is is an approach uh, is an approach going forward. I think that in terms of what this you know, how this retail interacts with the street, the intent is there's a tenant in there and that tenant interacts with the street and that tenant has full access to the street. It's gonna be an extremely lively streetscape. They're gonna have, you know, it's, it's like, uh, it's, all, it's all glass. So it's gonna be very apparent, open. Um, any tenancy that's in there is gonna interact directly with the street and it's gonna be extremely, extremely active. I think it'll obviously serve the downtown, the tenants and, um, and do well for uh, the street's good. So, so I appreciate that. And I just, I was just wondering if you can combine those spaces and, you know, I was looking, when you look at the criteria for um, our various legal criteria in the design review standards, it talks about scale and it says um, the scale of the structure or landscape alteration should be compatible with, with its architectural or landscape design style and character and that of the surroundings. And this is the sentence. The scale of ground level design elements such as building entryways, windows, porches, plazas, parks, pedestrian furniture, plantings, and other street and site elements should be determined by and directed toward the use, comprehension, and enjoyment of pedestrians. And so, so I just see the front of your building could be a lot more, could be bigger, more interactive. And, um, you know, in One East Pleasant Street, you do have that kind of covered space. It has never occurred to me that that would be public space. I always figured that was you know, the, the restaurants. And so it looks like instead of repeating that error, what about, you know, making a better better street, better front? front? And I wonder what other planning board members you know, yeah, think. Yeah, at this time. We're, we're, not in, we're not in the live theater anymore. Right, yeah, at this time, uh, Doug, if you could afford me one more interruption. I, I actually forgot to, to chime in with, with uh, Tom Long and the design review board. Uh, you know, outcome if, if it happened at all. So it has not happened yet. Okay. All right. I think we still have two weeks before our presentation. I believe it's on July 15th, but I will get that date specific and get back to everybody on that in a moment. Okay. All right. 
Um, so, you know, I'd like to just kind of plow through this. I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about the front of the building uh, right now, but thank you for those comments, Janet. Um, and uh, Doug, if you could proceed, thank you. Okay, Jack. Um, I guess the second point that Chris uh, cited was if we could talk a little bit about the parapet on the roof and the size of the mechanical equipment uh, and maybe whether the parapet wall is high enough or not. Uh, to, sure, to address that, um, we have not increased the size of the parapet uh, on this project, on this uh, proposal. Um, the 57 feet is to the top of the parapet, and that remains. Um, we've used roof screening that is photovoltaic panels on the south side. Um, we've got an elevator overrun, we've got a generator room, uh, and have proposed a roof screen that, that would enclose all of the mechanical equipment. Um, and is the uh, screen at least as high as the equipment? The screen is as high as every piece of equipment except for the uh, generator, which is always stuck up above them because of the curves that they have because of their vibration and they get tested once a month and they're on the roof. Mm -hmm. So those always stand up a bit tall. So in this case, what we've done is we have built a room around it that you can see on the left side of this page here, right here. That All helps right. us break up this facade a bit, replicates that a little and encloses that equipment completely. Okay. Um, Jack, I assume we can come back to any of these topics, you know, either, oh, sure. to, either tonight or whenever we can continue this. Absolutely. Uh, the next item was uh, just a simple question about the landscape and the plantings and whether the landscaped area is irrigated. Uh, it, the, land, uh, the landscape area could be irrigated. All right, so at the moment you haven't really decided. Correct. All right, um, so the next one has to do with the ambient light uh, and the lighting you've got on the building. Um, all the light fixtures you've uh, given us catalog cuts for are uh, downcast and heavily shielded. I, I'm sure they're all dark, dark sky. Uh, compliant, but uh, we actually wondered if you've looked at or thought at all about the level of ambient light that's coming from the street lights and such, and whether really rather, whether there's adequate light uh, on your site at night. Uh, we don't. We take safety very seriously. We don't think it's too. It's not bright enough to be safe. Um, we also find that a lot of buildings are overlit um, and we don't want to do that. So I think anybody who's been past one East Pleasant at 4.30 in December um, has seen that the black downcast lights that we have are pretty, you know, light up the pedestrian space and not much else. And we've tried have, to continue that. Have here. you done a, or will you be doing a photometric plan? Uh, yes, we have done that. And I haven't sent that to Chris, but I will. Yeah, I that. that would be helpful, I think. Okay. All right, then the next item, um, you asked for a waiver on the site and plan and that we would talk about that at a future date. Um, do you intend to have at least some signage on the building to indicate the, the address or, the, or yeah. the name of the building? Uh, the address definitely, which we'd work with fire uh, and, and police to determine the best location for that. I think it's probably, um, uh, you know, going to be vinyl letters as we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know if there's going to be a name of the building somewhere. Um, and uh, that would be TBD. And we'd want to do that prior to, you know, the installation of any sign. Mm -hmm. As again, our, the signs on our buildings have always been pretty subtle. Okay where we've had them. All right, um, the next item had, was under traffic impact and uh, the fact that you've eliminated the parking. 
And um, I guess, uh, what kind of advice do you give to potential applicants about a, a building where you do, where we don't where you don't provide any parking? Um, do you give guidance about what the town offers, or do you are you uh, you know mute on that subject? Uh, I'm, our property management staff describes these as downtown buildings, um, describes the parking realities and describes what the parking options are for the folks that have cars. All and that right. obviously includes the town, Doug. So. Yeah. Um, would you uh, be able to submit sample leases for for the retail yes. for the retail or commercial and the residential spaces all of them yes all right so if you could send those to chris all right the next item uh isn't really a question for kyle we still need to hear back from the fire department on their comments i think those came in all right chris is am i correct on that i haven't received them um, and I asked Pam to check on that, and I don't think she's received them either. I understand that the fellow who does that work has been out for a while, so we've um, mm -hmm. sent him a, a nudge to mm -hmm. submit something. Um, I just want to note that we'll come back to parking. I saw Janet's hand. Oh, good. Okay, thank go you. Go up. We'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, I'm sure we'll probably come back to most of these. Yes. <laughs> All right, the next item had to do with the building height and uh, whether whether there are other buildings in the area that are the same height as you are proposing. Uh, when he's pleasant next door is obviously very similar, a little bit taller. Uh, Kendrick Place is almost identical. Okay. And I guess I, I, I was... Well, I'd like to come back to height myself later. All right, so I think, let's see. Oh yeah, there were a bunch more. Chris, you had a lot of recommendations. Um, on the construction logistics, do you intend to use the West Cemetery for any access to the site during construction? Uh, I do not intend to. I think the issue of removing trees that are on the property line needs to be understood by everybody. That would need, you know, to involve uh, uh, some work there. Yeah. Um, but uh, otherwise, especially moving the building further back, the intent is to be able to get machinery in there on our property and not have to require any action on the town side. Okay, great. What page are you on, Doug? Well, I'm up to page nine. Nine, okay. And uh, item 14, parking. Um, it, Chris first has another item about where pen, park tenants are gonna park. But the second one has to do with bicycle parking. I believe that's, you know, you've got a, a bicycle storage room on the first floor there, is that right? Correct. And then uh, would there likely be a bike rack out front for visitors to the retail or something? Uh, we have not proposed a bike rack out front. I think that, um, as we said last time, that this, this town right of way between the property line and the curb is something that we'd like to support in whatever way we could um, and take guidance from the town in terms of what we could or should put out there. Okay. We're obviously reducing, there's going to be one less curb cut out there because we're eliminating the one here. Mm -hmm. Make it into a crosswalk. We'll eliminate the existing curb cut that we've got here. So there's opportunities out here that we're, uh, okay. we could defer to what the town is seeking out there. All right. Um, would you be amenable to perhaps widening the public sidewalk along that stretch? Uh, Absolutely. I mean, there's an existing, some existing public sidewalk here yep. that we'd have to reconcile if we were going to widen it significantly beyond its, its distance here. And then it does need to 
you know, somehow coordinate with the north side of this curb cut. But yeah, this could be, we could do a lot of creative things here. All right. So, so Chris had pointed out a couple of things we might think about there. Uh, and then the last item is on page 10. Let's see. Oh yeah, the uh, small set of steps you have on the south side mm -hmm. that go from this property over to One East Pleasant. Um, she was observing that that may need to be a ramp to be compliant with Mass Access Board, or if you know if 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 it is in fact not compliant now, it may need to be el eliminated. So I, uh, we've seen that and we believe we do have a ramp because this, in order to make up that distance, you effectively have to come out, out and back up. Oh, I see. So right, we, there, there is an accessible way. This is just a, a non-accessible shortcut. Okay. All right, so that's everything that Chris had in, in the site development report. I'll yield the floor to others. Thanks so much, Doug. This is very helpful. <laughs> um, we have other comments from the board at this time. Uh, Maria, please. Yeah, thanks for doing that, Doug. That was great. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, maybe luckily or unluckily, we're, at, we're able to see the impacts of what the uh, inclusionary zoning, potential inclusionary zoning bylaw uh, impacts will be. Um, I was always kind of reticent about it just because it didn't seem to have a, you know, uh, a sort of a balance as far as, you know, how to make building an Amherst um, uh, attractive. And I know a lot of people have said, you know, people will always build an Amherst. It's, you, you, you know, people, developers will come and so we've set up another hurdle. And so I, I can see clearly, as Doug sort of touched on, that um, in order to meet it, and I'm glad that um, Archipelago and the owners are able to make it work as far as just, you know, increasing quantity. Um, they could have just raised the rent and just covered it that way. So instead, yeah, they, they've sort of done a lot of number mm -hmm. shifting. And um, I guess uh, my question is, you know, the ones that aren't really appealing are the ones on the first floor, but at least they're sort of out of sight as we've sort of discussed in other zoning bylaw things. Um, and there's landscaping um, on the south and you've sort of um, put a buffer there. I wonder if just, you know, those units, uh, yeah, they're, they're probably of all the units are the least appealing. I wonder if you um, consider, you know, those are tall, narrow windows, maybe they're larger, higher windows or something just because it is south facing, they're probably could potentially get nice lights um, if they're not too shaded by the adjacent building. That was just one consideration for those um, five studio apartments on the first floor. Um, and then the other issue with those was just, um, you know, maybe, maybe there's a little bit more landscaping. Um, we've had other projects come in front of us where the first floor units are always this sort of like, you know, when they're, especially when they're on the street side or public sides, they're just, um, you know, they'll end up having their blinds pulled all the time. And so they're not really ideal. Um, yeah. So, if, yeah, so if this is a way to think about the, the fenestration a little more for those, I mean, I like the way they look, but I think, you know, it's just, if they have the blinds up all the time, it's kind of pointless to have them. Um, and then I'm still a little confused about the grading on the east. I appreciate that you've pulled it back more, um, but it did seem really steep. And uh, I, I guess I haven't seen a contour plan or I just saw like two elevations and it didn't seem like that those two lines would be enough to mediate that huge slope on the east side toward the cemetery. Is there a plan we can look at that shows how that grading and the building um, sort of transition? Um, even the elevations, it was hard to see. <clears throat> on the sure. East. I'll, I'll pull up Sybil. Okay. Real quick, and just so you know that the the ground floor units are on the ground floor. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, they do have extremely high ceilings, so um, they're a little bit wider, bigger square footage wise than the upper units because they're not the walls don't have to align because this is still a steel and concrete podium, so we can be flexible in terms of the size of the units. Um, so they're wider and taller in terms of ceiling height um, to 
make them as best they can on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. And it's all landscape out in front, mm -hmm. which is better than we saw as a, as a, better than a curtain. So if we look at his existing grade, sorry. So you can see here what we're working with. This is the existing situation, right? So the existing pavement out behind Cousins Market right now is 291. The existing pavement in the cemetery is 295. So there's a four foot grade change right here between the asphalt and the grade at the cemetery. Um, it is a little better down here at the south side where this is 291.3 and this is 293.3. So it's only a two foot grade change down here. So the cemetery pitches this way and this way and it's highest, it's the biggest delta is right here where you can see all this grade change between the existing kind of pavement and this tree that Eversource just took down right here. So our intent is instead of having this be 291, we're gonna bring this up to 293 and a half. So we're gonna add two feet of grade to that. And then it'll, it'll have a similar pitch here at the north side of the building. So that when you look at this at the new building from the north side, the grade will be closer to the cemetery side than it is on the existing cousins market side. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. No, I was worried there was like this gully where water was going to basically go washing nope. down. Just trying to use the building as a retaining wall. Gotcha. Okay. Um, right. Uh, to increase the grade um, and, and try to make it a, a little closer to what it used to be. And um, yeah, I guess since we also touched on the front of the building, I actually appreciate the way the front is uh, designed. I currently think that uh, that covered outdoor area and the way it peels back from the street is going to be a really nice activated place. And with all that glazing, I mean, that retail should have a huge impact on the street. So um, I, I like the way that there's a, a peel back on the second floor, which allows for this covered outdoor area. Um, I think if you were to peel back that corner, that blue corner, and make it parallel with up above, it wouldn't be as interesting of a sort of covered area as far as the building form. So I, I, I kind of like the way it is now, but um, I do, the last thing that, um, I forget it was Doug or Jack brought up about the um, possibly in, um, uh, editing the town sidewalk, that's very appealing to see if we can get more space there. And, um, the sort of curb cuts and the landscape patches. Um, so that combined with the overhang you provided, I think could be a really nice sort of streetscape. Um, so hopefully something will come out of that as far as the town property and the crosswalk and how it interacts with the front of your building. But um, I'm glad to see this project is still going. So <laughs> I'm sure we'll be dis discussing more, but um, yeah, thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I have a small follow-up. Um, with the historical commission recommending the fence move to the property line. Um, how does that relate to the way the, the fence situation on one East Pleasant between the cemetery and the building? Will there be, is it a straight shot? Will there be a, like a jog or is the fence on the property line down at one East Pleasant and not here or? Well, there's the fence and the trees are inter are obviously connected, right? Yeah. Um, the location of the trees as shown here in this image is right on the property line. They grew up in the slope, right? So if we're gonna backfill, as I was just saying to Maria and increase that grade, we're gonna affect the environment that these trees you know, grew up in. The fence was placed where it is because those trees were already there. Okay. Right? And so the fence had to go on the town side of the property because there was trees in the way. If those trees are no longer there, then you can move the fence. If the trees remain, you can't move the fence. Okay. Um, so I think that uh, at the One East Pleasant Gaylord Gate entrance, there's a granite marker that is on the property line. Okay. So the fence is on the property line right when it turns and goes to the Gaylord fence. It deviates from it as it comes through this image here and is okay. a couple of feet off of it. So the historical commission did talk about the setback. Um, I, I understand concerns about where to plant trees. 
Um, we've obviously proposed planting trees on our side, um, which we'd like to keep to, right? I think that if you keep the fence where it is, then you have a little more space to plant trees on this side. If you move the fence, you have a little more place to plant trees on the town side. Um, we'd be open to either. Um, what we're proposing is uh, taking down the trees that are on the grade, planting new trees on our property and leaving the fence as is. Like I said, we'd be open to whatever the best solution is to resolve the trees and the fence together. Thank you so much for that, Kyle. Um, Tom and then Janet. Sure, that was actually my question about the recommendation for trees um, to be on the cemetery side and then Kyle's proposal for trees on their, their side of the fence. So I was just interested in Kyle's response to the conundrum there and he just answered that question. So I'm okay for okay. the moment. Uh, Janet and then Doug. I would, I would like to um, talk a little bit about what the percentage of, um, of retail or commercial or professional space there is out front vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the building um, because it looks kind of, I know it's gotten bigger, but I, I, I don't have a handle on what the footprint of the whole building is. Do you know the percentage of um, space available for retail there? Kyle? The retail is 2,200 square feet. That is this blue portion that wraps to the south now and the back of house, which will be bathrooms, kitchen, back of house. So that's 2,200 square feet. Okay, but I, what's the footprint of the whole building? I'm sorry, not being clear. So I'm trying to figure out what the percentage is because I, I think I have from um, Mr. Bockelman or Christine or the planning department that they're saying it's gonna be 13%, um, maybe it's bigger now. And I was comparing it to other um, recent um, larger buildings like one University Drive South where it's 39%, Kendrick Place is 42%, um, One East Pleasant is 35%. So can, can you, I mean, we don't have to answer it right now, but I'm wondering about what the percentage is. Uh, I would say we have, we have put retail on 100% of our street frontage. Yeah, but you're not actually answering my question. I mean, so, so, you know, one of the I think things- you're, I, think, I think that the, the, the reality of this site is that it is 80 feet wide and 300 feet long. Okay, I can do that. And, right, and so if there, was, if there was retail to be placed, we're not gonna place retail back along the cemetery because yeah. we're not gonna be able to rent it. Mr. Mr. Wilson, I don't really wanna argue, but I'm just asking a simple question, like what is the percentage of the footprint dedicated to retail? I don't know why, I mean, that's all I'm asking. Yeah, Kyle, just so you know, yeah. we have this mixed use building bylaw that we've been discussing and we've been talking about like 40% retail on the first floor and some minimum standards. So that's why we're kind of hung up on the percentage. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate that. I'm not trying to be argumentative. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to highlight that when those numbers are are try, are pulled out and, try, and, and we're, we're seeking to justify whether it should be 10 or 40 or 70, um, it's, it, it has to recognize the existing condition. The areas where mixed use are allowed is BG. BG, the parcels in BG are shaped like this. You know, Mr. Wilson, I, I'm sorry. Unique. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, you know, I just, I know all this and, and it sounds like you don't want to increase it and you're giving an argument for why not. I'm just wondering what is the percentage of retail on this building? That's and I'm, I'm not trying to be obtuse. I just have never calculated the percentage Okay. relative to the, uh, the, the building. And I think that um, per the coverages, you know, this, this, the square foot footage of the ground floor is one thing if you're going to the outside of this wall here, right? It's another thing if you're going to the outside of the second floor, which is, which is, which is larger. So I have not done the calculations for those. It's for the building, I mean, you know, the percentage of the building, I believe, not the site. But of all five floors. Excuse me, I just wanted to say that we have that information. I don't have access to it right now, but I'd be happy to send it to the planning board tomorrow. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Um, Janet, you good for now? Um, well, you know, I, I, you know, so 
we had talked a lot about this um, at our last meeting about mixed use buildings and what percentages. And it, I had mentioned in 2016, um, the planning board had brought to town meeting with the planning department, um, with the approval of the select board, a, a, an, a requirement of 60% non-residential space on the first floor. And I read the um, planning board's report to town meeting and it was very persuasive. And so, um, and I know that more recently the planning department is recommending 40%. And so I think that, you know, the, the reason we have a BG, a downtown is basically for business and commercial people to come visit, to visit museums, to eat and all those things. And so the, the genius of mixed use buildings is, you know, you get to do all that on the first floor, at least on the first floor, but you bring in some res residential units and the gift that the <coughs> get is a lot of density that you wouldn't get elsewhere. And so my question is, is this enough? And so at our last time we talked about this under, you know, three of the five, you know, permits, we, you know, it seemed like a lot of the planning board members were thinking it's not big enough. Um, and then we talked about having smaller stores or, you know, kind of a mall, like a little mall or something. And, you know, this building itself is replacing, I think, at least three, maybe five, I can't remember, um, little businesses. And the other buildings have replaced 12 or 15. And so we have a decreasing amount of small shops downtown. As somebody said to me yesterday, who works downtown, there's no reason to come here. Um, you know, there's not that much to do. And so I'm wondering is, you know, the, the north side of this building has, you know, is there's people coming back and forth. It's near Prey Street. It's got a big facade. Um, there's going to be a lot of people in the building. There's a lot of people, you know, and so the whole idea is let's give them something to do, places to shop. And I know that um, one East Pleasant Street hasn't been very successful in renting a fairly large, you know, retail space, but you know, downtown is pretty, all the little shops are pretty full. I mean, there's, we very rarely have the um, problem that Northampton does. So I'm wondering, do we need to see more here? Could you shrink the lobby or move things around a little bit more with, and that, that's my observation. And my concern is we're just losing more and more places for people to, to have businesses. And if some, if someone says retail is dead, I'm going to, I, I have to say yesterday I drove down Route 9 from College Street Motors to Reliable or Reliance Auto, and there were 37 businesses there. They're all small. Maybe the biggest is Florence Savings Bank. All, you know, there was one empty storefront, I think. There's, you know, retail is not dead. Small shops are not dead. They just need places to be. All right, thanks, Janet. Doug? Thanks, Jack. Okay, um, so Kyle, uh, since you've told us how many beds uh, this, this revised plan has, I need to just say that I am sorry that in the revision we've lost 20 beds. Uh, you know, if, if, if the inclusionary zoning was in part re uh, a reaction to this, or, you know, I'm sorry that by gaining 11 affordable units, or we've lost an overall of 20 beds. Um, then second of all, is it right on that uh, along the east side, this building would align with one East Pleasant's frontage against uh, the, the cemetery or not? Uh, no, it'll be further back now. It'll be 10 feet instead of five feet. So one East Pleasant is only five feet back? One East Pleasant is Correct. In the same location that the carriage shops were with the existing barrel. Okay. All right. There was a there was a note on one of the site plans that said align. And that made me think they were the same. And that was the intent on the original submission. Okay. I hope there wasn't a note that was left that still said align because that's not the intent now. Yeah, I thought it did say it on what I'm yeah on. PR 0 01. If you go back to two drawings, still has the align pointing to five feet instead of 10 feet. Yep. So that note is incorrect. That align. Okay. All right. Good. That's why it points to the middle of the tree instead of the building. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so on the first floor studios, since they are on the floor with the highest floor to floor height, uh, are they loftable or is that not quite the case? 
I bet they could be loftable. Um, I, we have not investigated lofting those. There's a lot of building code issues that we have not again. So I think these would, you know, you'd have an 11 and a half foot ceiling, um, you know, slightly larger studio on the ground floor. Uh huh. And I noticed that there's a ramp at the entrance to the hallway with mm -hmm. the studios. Why is that happening? Because this grade out here has to be met. Uh, and okay. this grade changes as it goes back. It stays pretty level at 288. It goes up to 289. And then back here at the cemetery is 293.5. So it stays pretty flat. It starts to grow up. So the other benefit of that is you kind of go up as you go from the public to the residential. And so and a would, bit of a would, does that mean that the, uh, let's say the windowsill for the, those studios is going to be a little bit elevated beyond grade on the south side? The windowsill, the, the slab height on the ground floor will be, uh, will be higher in the residential than it is in the non-residential. Uh, the grade out here on the south side is 293, 292 and a half, something like that. So the grade is higher than the slab in here. Oh, and it the, is. But the, the window sill is, I think, at 30 inches in the ground floor. And then the windows are very tall. They go up okay. and you can see on the All right. Well, I, I guess I was hoping that the grade was lower than the slab elevation. Yeah, and that's just trying to make all the grades work on all four or five, six yep. sides of this building. Okay. Then my next question maybe is a question for Chris or, or Rob. Um, how do we calculate the building height for the purposes of, of these special permits or waivers for building height? And the reason I'm asking is when I look at the elevations, um, the highest elevation I'm seeing is 57 feet. But as I go around the building, because the grade increases as I go from west to east, um, the height is lower at the east end. And every time that I've had to calculate a building height from a point of view of a, of a building code compliance, we use the average height you know, all the way around the building. So, so the building height is actually not 57 feet. It's probably something closer to 55 feet if you use that approach. Uh, yep, uh, we, we've just defined it through how height is defined in the Amherst bylaw, which is, you know, street side of the structure, okay. average grade. So, right. so, you, so that's you're saying the bylaw the bylaw calls for the street elevation as the, the measurement to use. Correct. And okay. in a building where the grade at the street is not the, is the lowest grade on site, then yeah, the building does not measure 57 feet from grade to top of parapet on the cemetery side or back on the south side. Yeah. It is lower. Okay. But per the bylaw, it's 57. Right. And then um, I, w I will, uh, Sort of echo what Maria said. I am. I. I do actually like the retail, the street edge uh, articulation with the setback that's not parallel to the street. And I'm glad to see that you have somewhat increased the retail area of the building. And then lastly, um, we saw Chris. We saw some uh, correspondence today from Janet and at least one public member of the public about the the uh, reconstructing the building and using that as the justification for a setback that's not 20 feet. I wonder if you could talk to us about how historically that section of the bylaw has been interpreted when you know when you're and, and whether it's historically been consistent that we interpret reconstructing as the ability to completely remove and build something entirely new. May I answer that? Yeah, yes, please. So um, two things, and Rob Mora is also here in the in the wings, so he might be called upon to answer too. But um, we do have one example that we could immediately bring to mind, which is the Zoning Board of Appeals recently um, 
approved uh, pretty much the same scenario on North Pleasant Street, um, a property that had um, a veterinarian's office that um, is now being um, torn down and is going to become a house. And um, the house is taking advantage of the setback um, <clears throat> that the veterinarian's office uh, experienced or had. Um, so that is a Zoning Board of Appeals case that's fairly recent. I also spoke to our town attorney, Joel Bard, this evening about this issue. And he said, um, this is a common um, occurrence throughout the Boston area, the Boston suburban area, where um, there are buildings, houses particularly that are um, on lots that may not be uh, conforming to current zoning requirements. And um, there's a sort of, what do you call it, syndrome or something like that. I can't, the word doesn't come to mind, but there's a, a, an, an, a fact that there are teardowns in these areas and they tear down small, um, you know, ranch houses and, and capes and they build um, much larger houses. And um, in particularly, you know, he, he mentioned Weston as one particular place where this happens, but there could be a small lot <clears throat> where a small ranch existed and the lot is undersized and the um, per person who purchases the property uh, takes advantage of the nonconformity of that um, lot to build a larger house. And so Joe Bard thinks this is a common use of this nonconformity. I believe it's talked about well, it's certainly talked about in Chapter 40A and what section of Chapter 40A? I think it's Section 5, but I'm not absolutely sure. And anybody who wants to know can be in touch with me tomorrow about that. Um, so anyway, um, nonconformities are talked about in Chapter 40A. And Joel says that this is a common practice in the eastern part of the state um, to take advantage of a nonconformity and tear the building down and build something new. So that, uh, that's the extent of my conversation with him. Hey, Chris, oh, my only comment is, I believe it's 40A section six. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Chris. And then I guess the, the last thing I'll say, um, you know, I think maybe we ought to talk a little bit about the, the street frontage and the public space or the, the right of way in front of this building and whether we as a board would like to impose some conditions that might uh, talk about the, the extent of sidewalk reconstruction and whether there's any other amenities, you know, like a bike rack or benches that we might want uh, Archipelago to install on the right of way. Um, you know, I'll just say I would support trying to uh, develop that to be the kind of streetscape we want from the, in the right of way. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, what are the, what's the board feeling in terms of taking a break here? It's, it's, it's eight o'clock, um, keep it pretty short. So like a five minute break. So uh, eight eleven, we can come back. So just turn your video off and, and mute. And uh, we'll see you in five minutes.
Uh, so uh, we need Tom. But um, Pam? Yes. We, we just reconvene? Yes. It's 8-11. Um, okay. I don't, I don't see Tom yet, but I see Chris has her hand raised. Okay. Chris? So I just wanted to say that I found the information about the um, percentage of the building that's proposed at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, the percentage that was calculated um, by building commissioner based on the drawings that we have. So it's probably not you know accurate to the exact square footage. But it, anyway, um, <clears throat> what he calculated was 13% of the ground floor is retail space, proposed retail space. Yeah, I, I guess I wonder from a practical standpoint, you know, when you have residential and you need, you know, lobbies and elevators and utility things that, you know, it's wondering if the 40% if the is a, is actually a good number, but. So I don't know if you want to get into this right now, but I can give you some examples of other buildings. Um, one you drive south is 39%. Um, non-residential. 462 Main Street is only 9% non-residential. 26 Spring Street is 12%. 70 University Drive is 2%. 1 East Pleasant is exactly is 35%. And we think that Kendrick Place is 42%. So those it's a wide range. And I can, um, if you wanted to look at this, this is in a memo that the town manager sent to the town council mm -hmm. on, uh, well, for their, for their meeting that occurred on the 28th of June. Um, um, so anyway, that's available there. And, and, and how did parking figure into that? Is that considered? Th that was not um, including any kind of parking calculation. I okay. don't believe. I, well, it might've been for one East Pleasant, uh, yeah because One East Pleasant does have parking on the ground floor. So I can't say for sure on One East Pleasant but or within, Kendrick Place, oh, because that oh, also has parking on the ground floor. But within the draft mixed use building, how is parking considered? Is it part of the commercial retail sector or something? It's part of the 60% that's being proposed for okay. non-residential. Yep. Non-resident, okay. Very good. Um, Doug? Uh, yeah, Doug. Yeah, I just wanted to say I assume we can continue this conversation when we when we talk about these the zoning amendments more. Yep. So, you know, I, I'd love to get into, but I, but I would like to to hear from Kyle. Um, you know, I I think you know we have that building that that is occupied used to be occupied by Bart's, where you know there's really it's a really deep footprint. And you have to go down the side of the building to access the, the Pita Pockets place and some of the other things along the side there. Um, you know, if if we had a forty percent requirement, would you would you start running your retail down the north side of this building as an access? Because because I agree with you, you don't want to have a really narrow, deep footprint without very much street frontage. Uh, so that's my question. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, Doug, actually. Um, so I could answer that ahead. briefly. Um, Please. I, I, I think that um, I think that we have to be ca cautious of um, allowing a number like 40% to drive or 60% or something to drive the conversation. I think that's happened in Amherst elsewhere. I think we have empty real, you know, retail because of it. Um, and I think that it's a, uh, I think that as I was saying earlier that the very unique sites in downtown in the BG district um, for them to be successful from a retail standpoint, if they're always dealing with a curb cut for parking and they're always, you know, uh, dealing with, um, 
uh, with other items, it's going to be difficult for them to, to really be successful. So if, if 40% was imposed, we would be building retail space that would be very difficult to lease. So the planning board would be saying, please build this retail space um, that may end up being empty for a while, but it's retail. And I think that's, I think that's, that, that would be the concern I would have with any bylaw that just puts a blanket amount on it. If the intent of the bylaw is to make sure it's not an ATM on the ground floor, I understand that. If the intent on the bylaw is to try to recognize the new reality of retail, and I agree with Janet, it's not dead, it's just different. Um, then I think there should probably be some more flexibility to it and, and try to come at it from a way where if you're looking at a site like this, that's only 80 feet wide, 300 feet deep, and you're saying, could you do something like, like uh, Bart's, or is that not a, allowable right now per bylaw, right? Is that not, you know, with egress and access, would you not be able to do that? So um, I don't think additional retail beyond the 2200 we've proposed here would be successful retail. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Janet, please. So Doug, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that reminds me of, um, Pita Pockets and Pandora East, and then also all those funky little stores in the um, carriage shops that were hard to get to, they weren't seen from the street. And actually Cousins Market isn't the same thing in the nail place. Like those are places that were really, you know, kind of not easy to see, but they were businesses that, you know, were, you know, were thriving, Amherst Music, all those places that I used to go. And um, so I think that actually is an idea to like go to do a little line of shops along that north side, because it's also kind of, I mean, that, that's a good idea. That's all I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to jump back to 9.22 and um, sadly chapter 40A section six. And so I appreciate the comments from um, attorney Bard, but surely he knows that uh, residential you know, homes, one and two family homes get treated differently than um, non-residential homes by the bylaw. So that that idea of the tear down and the standards for that are different from what we're faced with here. And so I have to say, it's kind of interesting to me because Mr. Bobrowski, I think is on this call is that I have been reading his book um, and I've been looking at some of the cases and I've been reading our bylaw and I've been reading the state statute. And I think this is a really, um, there isn't really a history of interpretation by the planning board of this. And I, you know, I can't speak to, you know, turning a vet's office into a home because maybe that kicks off the other section. So I don't want to talk about something I don't, haven't looked at. I also don't want to offer like a hard legal opinion, but I can't see how um, it seems to me that either uh, Archipelago has to go to the ZBA for a variance or they have to have a 20 foot rear setback. And I don't see how they really get out of that. Um, first of all, these are two small buildings that are being completely torn down. They're not being reconstructed in any way. And the pictures that I sent to the planning board, I don't know if, if Pam can pull those up. Um, you know, I have, have pictures from the front and from the back. And then when you look at this new building, there's nothing left. It's not like they rebuilt that funky little cousin's market they're not rebuilding the Piper, little sweet little Piper building. Um, you know, there's nothing, there's, I don't know where that those buildings are. They're not being reconstructed. They're not being expanded. They're not there anymore. There's not even a wall being saved. And so I think that, um, and not only that, they're not even replicating the nonconformity. They're actually pushing it closer to the cemetery in a lot of spots. And so I think, I think legally, I see them either going to the, the ZBA with a variance or coming, you know, sticking to the 20 foot rear setback. And here's the benefits of the rear setback is it will buffer the cemetery um, and it will, it will, and which is what the historical commission wants. It will provide some more drainage, more space for the trees. And it can be that outdoor space, recreational space for the tenants that really, you know, isn't being really met. Um, and you know, so it could be a really nice space for everybody, and it will be complying with the bylaw and the state law. And so, um, you know, I've sent my my memo around to people. Um, I think this issue we have to look at and find out more. And so, I would ask um, that we need a, a legal memo from Mr. Bard or an outside counsel or somebody telling us like what is the law, what are the legal standards. 
what is the what are the cases say because i'm looking at cases where like when they talk about increasing the nonconformity, they're looking at like two more feet on a garage you know and they're talking about the percentage you know it's just it's it's very exacting it's very case specific but if you look at these pictures which i can't quite see i can see like the edge of something pam oh no oh, thank you thank you i can so that so you know this you know you know the line the line of nonconformity for, you know from the rear line the court would really look at and we ha we need to really look at it um you know pam all i'm seeing is kind of like the the right hand edge of things is anybody else in that situation no i see the whole thing okay i see I the whole picture so now i'm just looking at the cousins yeah and so then it you know so i i think there's a big legal issue in here um I don't want kind of a, I think we just need to get it basically a good memo on it that lays out the law, lays out the cases, lays out the legal standard, and I'm sure we're bright enough to apply it to this situation. I just don't see how they get away from it looking at, you know, the cases cited by Mr. Bobowski and his thing. I've looked up some of those. Um, I just think they're, that's where we are. Yeah, Janet, on that, I. I'm just looking at your memo. Um, the other thing is, is that the nonconformity is, you know, that the little jagged line. If you look at, what is it? The, um, the pre and post lot development, you can see why the new building is overall closer to the line. And also when you, when you look at it, realize it's going up. It's not just one story with this um, funky, um, you know, stove pipe or, you know, brick fireplace. It's, it's five stories high. And so that's very significant. Um, it's, you know, the lot, lot the, the, the line of the building is generally closer than the current nonconformity, kind of a big no-no. Um, you know, the expansion, the alterations need to comply with the bylaw, otherwise get a variance. I mean, that's, you know, I'm looking at, you know, Mr. Borowski's textbook and the cases. So I'm not sure how they get out. I mean, I, I think I kind of, you know, I don't know how they get out of this conundrum but I see the benefits of a 20 foot setback. Um, it will benefit to the tenants, it'll be benefit drainage, it'll be better place for plantings. Um, we, and the benefit to me is that we're actually implementing the bylaw and the state law as it's written. And I, I can't speak to how, you know, the ZBA might have done it in a different case without knowing the facts and, and the details of that. But I don't, I don't think there's a historical, you know, a history of us doing this interpretation, but I, I want us to do it right. Yeah, I'm just uh, just want to refer to your memo, um, and it says like section nine point two does allow a non-confirmed building to be structurally, blah blah blah, reconstructed, which is probably the closest thing that you know would would align with with the with the project, yeah, provided that the authority that's us um, finds that that it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing one. And then you can look at the existing situation. Um, so the question- Sure, sure, wait, let me finish. Uh, I have sure, to it's gonna increase five stories, but look look at, at the stat, the, <laughs> the state of the buildings right now uh, back there. It, it is an eyesore. Um, so fact, that, that kind of happens. That, that's what goes through my mind. If it's not reconstruction, if this building is not being reconstructed, you don't go on. Well, what does that mean? Reconstructed well, building. I, I, you know, rebuilding it. Yeah. Well, that never happened. You 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 build a new building. If you're reconstructing it, it's it's not. No. What they're no. doing is they're tearing down two buildings and they're putting on new construction yeah. and trying to kind of say, okay, we're gonna hang on the other nonconformity. We've reconstructed these buildings that we can't see or identify. We can't see the any anything's left. We don't see the nonconformity left. And they're like, no, no, you know, we can, we can do that. I just don't see how they get there. I don't see the cases, and I don't see the law. Um, I mean, I see your point that they're kind of junky, yeah. You know, of course, but that that's the whole thing. They can tear it down and build a new construction, but they have to be twenty foot off, twenty feet off the residential district. That's it. Did uh, Doug, you have your hand up? Yeah, I had it all up, up and then down and then up and then down. I wasn't sure whether I would say anything, but, you know, I think I, I, I do wonder, though, if we took a, a more narrow view of reconstruction, whether we might end up with people 
say leaving two leaving the exterior wall along the east side of this property and then building four stories on top of it so that you know there's a a sort of vestigial remnant of the original building just to meet the narrow you know uh interpretation of what it means to reconstruct you know maybe if if, if people say you've got to have some of the original building remaining well, then they'll leave a wall or a foundation or something and then just build around it. So, and I'm not sure that's really the kind of practical result that we would really want. And so, I mean, I agree with Janet, we ought to have a clear uh, opinion about this topic before we uh, make any sort of act. Good points, Doug. Uh, Tom, you had your hand up. And then Janet. Sure, uh, my, my comment was kind of exactly the same as Doug's. I, I took it down um, in regard to that. But, you know, I mean, is the solution, is what we want some vestige of what's here now with something added to it? Or do we, or are we interested in something that's better for the site and for, for the context? So I guess my, my question was in line with Doug's kind of what's the end goal here in terms of improving a particular place from X, Y, and Z perspective. Um, but I mean, I agree, I agree with, with Doug and with Janet, we have to look at it, I think, in more depth, but I also think we need to think about what our end goals are. Um, and that keeping you know, this chunk of wall that we see here um, with some trash behind it and not touching it isn't improving anything in that area. So I think we need to think about what the, what the eventual outcomes are gonna be. Great, Janet. Um, first of all, nobody has to leave their property with trash on it anyway, but that's, that's not the, that's not the legal, that's not the law. Like, oh, does it look better? Do we feel better about it? Um, you know, there's, you know, I could cite cases where they're like, you know, what does reconstruction mean? Well, it means what it says is, is this building being rebuilt? You know, plain meaning of the words, they're having, you know, normal applications. And so we might want thinking, oh, we like this building, we want it here, let's ignore the law. But the, you know, there's case after case after case. And the Supreme Judicial Court is looking at that saying, is this an alteration? You know, and they, they're literally saying like, okay, they reconstructed this and they added some more, that's okay. Or no, they went to like 60 units from a hotel to something else, that's not okay. And so we have to follow the law. And so if we're end gaming and saying, well, we want to get to our results. So we're just going to twist everything to that. I'm not there. And I, I don't think the planning board can be there. It's, we can't go there. We have to apply the state law. We have to apply our bylaw. Um, and then even if, even if you said this is reconstruction, then you have to ask the question is, you know, is this substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood? And so here we have the historical commission saying we really prefer 20 feet. Um, you can look at these buildings side by side and see how they really have almost no impact on the historic cemetery and the, you know, the people in it, the people buried in it, the visitors. Um, and then you can look at a five-story, but what a five-story building looks like. And you could say, is that substantially more detrimental? And you could answer that yes. Um, and then you could have someone come in and say, you know, one story, closer line is maybe okay, but five stories is not. And so these cases go like this over and over and over again. And I think, I don't want Joel Bard's opinion. I want him to explain to the planning board what the law says, what does the statute say? What are the standards? What do the cases say? And then we can figure out how we apply it. I mean, I think we have that muscle in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we want to hear from Rob? Uh at this time, because I know he was instrumental uh, in the early review of this. Is he, on, is he in the audience? He is there. Pam would have to move him in to be a panelist if he wanted to say something. Yeah, I don't want to twist your arm, Rob, but. Um, He's got his hand up. Okay. I just tried to move him.
He should be coming over. There he there is. is. Can we can we ask um, Dorothy Pam and Pam Rooney to mute their microphones because we're getting a lot of sound. From them. They're still in there. Or or move them back to the public. It's just Pam that has her microphone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi, uh, Rob Mora, Building Commissioner. Uh, so yeah, good good conversation going on here about what mean, what is reconstruction, uh, both uh, the state law 40A section six and uh, our bylaw don't define that. Uh, you, you certainly can find in situations and bylaws across the state where uh, teardowns and rebuild are, are addressed in this manner. Uh, our bylaw doesn't, doesn't address it in any specific way, doesn't give any particular meaning to the word reconstruction. What's interesting is that our bylaw does say that you can add four stories on top of the one story building that's there through this path. Uh, so, you know, our feeling has been that reconstruction could be tear down rebuild. We don't have a lot of examples of it. The one that Christine mentioned uh, across the street is the first that I could think of that the zoning board has granted in recent years uh, that isn't one and two family, that isn't uh, say, parking lot expansion or lot coverage or building coverage related. But in any of those cases that we have dealt with, uh, in most of those situations, in fact, the end result is not the same as what the beginning was. Uh, so we haven't applied it in that manner. So I think it's, it's really what you think reconstruction is, uh, uh, absent any particular meaning. And, I, and I, my sense is, is that's what, what the, 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 the study from Joel Bard will give you is that, uh, you know, he's pointing to cases in Weston. I worked in Weston. I know exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about houses being torn down that are close to the site setback, being rebuilt much larger, utilizing that setback, that, re, that reduced setback. And that happened all the time there. So I think those are the types of examples that he's going to, to find. But we don't have... We don't have examples here that we've applied this to other than that first, uh, that first case, uh, North Pleasant Street. Uh, what what about one, uh, one, excuse me, one East Pleasant Street where there's a five foot, you know, the, the carriage shops was also five foot. Um, so it's, yeah, Jack, what's interesting about that one is our bylaws changed in recent years and there used to be an opportunity in table three with a footnote for the planning board to modify that setback. And that was lost when, when a number of the footnotes were removed from table three and this text and moved into this text uh, and, and the, uh, the ability to waive or modify that 20 foot dimension doesn't exist anymore. And it was there when uh, one East Pleasant Street was uh, applied for. Great, uh, thank you so much, Rob. Why don't you hang on in case anybody has questions. Uh, Chris? No, I'm sorry. I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, looks like we could move on to public comment. If I see no other hands from the board. All right. So we'll open up to public comment on this on this uh, on these hearings. And I see Dorothy Pam and then Pam Rooney. And then Hilda Greenbaum. You have three minutes that your name and, and address, please, Dorothy. Okay, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, I'll start with something nice. I like the corner two bedroom apartments. I think that gives a, a flexibility to the building that some of the buildings don't have in that it could be a family apartment. Um, I am a little concerned about the side entrance uh, purely from the female point of view. Uh, it being maybe a little bit scary at night, uh, a place where you, somebody could be lurking to jump at you. But I assume you'll have cameras um, on, that, on that spot. Um, I am con con confused by the big space that you have on the north side, because that was originally where you were gonna have cars coming in to parking on the first floor, but you removed the parking in the building. So I'm wondering why you have that much big space so that when Janet said, maybe move the whole building back just a little bit and scrunch up that space. It seemed reasonable to me, but I'm, you know, um, I am concerned that you have no thought of some space outside of the building for parking. Um, I believe that the policy of town um, permits, uh, they're not gonna be $25 a year very soon. So um, 
that's something that's been talked about by a lot of people on the council. Um, and the question of the 20 foot setback from the cemetery, I think that's really very crucial because um, there's been just a lot of wonderful things that have been uh, happening with the cemetery and um, with the town. It's a, it's a sacred space in town. And um, you know, I, the whole reconstruction argument, I can see how that can be played really strangely, but I agree what was there maybe not as good looking as what you're going to do. But then if you build something new, you're not reconstructing and then you're not entitled to keeping the nonconformity. I mean, of course you can build something new, but the whole idea was since there was something there, we're reconstructing this, we can keep the nonconformity. I think that gets a little bit uh, specious. So the, the, my, the image I have is, you know, the, at the end of Death of the Salesman, we, we've had all these scenes with Willie Loman in the house and the yard and the boys doing their things. And there's a scene near the end where the house is this it looks like a little teeny thing and it's dwarfed by all these big buildings that have moved in and cast shadows on it. And um, the idea of that kind of happening over the cemetery being dwarfed and shadowed by the buildings is kind of strong. So I'm really speaking strongly uh, in favor of the 20 foot setback. Uh, I think you guys have been really working on improving your design. And um, uh, you know I really do applaud you for it, but just to, a, as, as a gift of the town, don't try to take everything you think you can get, keep the 20 foot setback and a lot of people will be a lot happier. So that's it. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, Pam, please, Pam Rooney, state your name and address. You have three minutes. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Thanks very much. Um, um, Dorothy, Pam spoke strongly to the 20 foot setback and I would strongly support that. Um, I think that's the appropriate um, dimension to maintain. Um, I have not heard the archipelago group uh, talk any, talk and address any of the issues or concerns that were raised about safety during construction and just some of the logistics. Uh, it would be very helpful for them to explain how they're going to deal with 15 North, uh, 15 East Pleasant Street, AKA Prey Street, and how that flow of traffic is going to occur. I would also ask if the planning board can please um, ask for some uh, pretty decent street uh, amenities and street tree plans, because I think we're, I've heard Mr. Wilson say a couple times, We'll do what the town asks for, but I would like to actually let's get a straw, let's get a straw man out there so that people can react to it. And I think one of the one of the absolute um, downfalls of One East Pleasant Street is the pathetic streetscape and the really subpar landscaping that was put in. And I and I think they need to convince the town that they're doing the right thing on this next project. So I think it'd be really helpful to have. Um, something in, in writing to show what they propose at least for the curb to front of building. Um, so some of the some logistics, some of the, the landscape plans, and also a discussion by the planning board of, of how they, um, what they think the best solution is for the, the cemetery fence, the cemetery tree planting and, and or the archipelago tree planting and, and just get that settled before it goes too much further. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Pam. Uh, Hilda Greenbaum, then Elizabeth Veerling. Hilda, state your name and address, please. Hi, Hilda. Hilda, can I see you that there's yourself? a lot of room for negotiating here because the developers are asking for a lot of things. Hilda, you uh, just state your name and address. Just oh, Hilda Greenbaum, two ninety eight Montague Road. I'm sorry about that. So Thanks. I am also uh, several things I'd like to mention, but one is I think the twenty foot setback to the seventeen thirteen cemetery is absolutely essential to protect that historic resource. A lot of people come to this town to visit those graves, particularly Emily's grave. There's constant 
uh, pilgrims that come to and leave the stones there. And so I was also at the hearing for the new sign that was uh, made. I haven't seen the sign yet, but I saw the design review board hearing on the sign for the cemetery. And I was appalled at the weeds and the lack of maintenance on one East Pleasant Street by the mural that yes, you did save, but it looks horrible, especially for tourists who come here to visit the cemetery. So make sure that I think the 20 set foot setback to mow and back there and cut the weeds down so that it doesn't look so disgusting. And then the other, the other big thing given as, as Jenna brought up, the number of small businesses that we have lost due to the construction at 1 and 11 and now 13 East Pleasant Street, I think that those five studios and perhaps even the two bedroom south side of that building, which are probably a good part of the year in shadow from the building to the south. And since those look into the garage parking area of the building to the south, I think that really you ought to negotiate that those ought to be rented out for commercial use to give a place to the small businesses that were lost. And I think that you can negotiate that. If they want the extra height, they want an ex extra so These are all things that are on the table, the fence, the trees, those five buildings, five studios there with 12 foot ceilings could very, very easily be small shops that are on a plaza that people can access to. And I, I, I really think you gotta do some hard head knocking together and get something that the town could use and not just people who own you know, the building from out of town who are you know, making their investments here, but there's gotta be an investment that benefits us too. And right now there's very little reason for me to go downtown other than that I have my hair done or have a Chinese meal, that's it. And we need to bring back all these little businesses that used to be drivers of, of our economy and think about what may be a million dollars taxes now, if we have more now downtown left, people want to go to, could actually not be three million in two years from now, but it could be down to 200,000 if we're not careful how we develop in a 12 month economy. That's what I want to say. Thank you, Hilda. Um, and Elizabeth Verlu, um, state your name and an address, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, yes, Elizabeth Beerling, 36 Cottage Street. Um, and I just wanted to address two things that I feel I haven't heard enough spoken about. And one was there was a discussion at a past meeting about having conformity of setback from the street. And I note that the way this building is proposed, it conforms with setback to One East Pleasant and to the People's Bank. Um, however, I think there's been a lot of discontent about the setback of One East Pleasant and the streetscape and having a five-story building at that setback doesn't really allow for mature shade trees that mitigate climate change, et cetera. Um, and People's Bank is only a one-story building, which is a much different effect on setback. Um, in contrast, if you go further down the street to the spoke, or to the former Bertucci's, the setback from the street is farther. And I would much rather see that be the standard for the setback at this part of town across from a nice park than setback that's right up against the sidewalk. So I would rather see the standard be set for a conforming setback be to the Bertucci's and to the spoke for the setback if we're gonna have a five-story building, then to One East Pleasant and the little tiny one-story People's Bank. So uh, that I think would allow for a mature street tree that otherwise is not really going to uh, be able to grow in this little tiny um, space that, that's gonna be between the sidewalk and the street. Um, my second concern is that no one has talked about parking um, we're talking about 114 beds 
that are going to sit on and obliterate over 30 parking spaces that are now in the space of that building. And so I would like to understand what the thoughts are um, about that. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I see no other hands raised um, from the public. So <clears throat> Kyle, would you like to respond to any of those comments? Yeah, sure. I can start wherever you like. Um, um, <laughs> uh, I think that the the obviously we think that the ten foot setback on the cemetery side is the best solution. Um, I think anybody advocating for a twenty foot setback needs to understand that that is fewer units, including fewer affordable units. Um, the ten foot setback is greater than the one East Pleasant setback. Uh, to the south, um, and it is greater in many places than the current existing buildings down there. So um, I think relative to the street side, um, you know, the current bylaw says there is a zero foot minimum front yard setback, which we've been adhering to. Um, I think we're trying to accommodate, you know, the, the uh, make as generous as possible that, that ground floor while keeping being able to build as many residential units as, as um, the site would allow, because that's that's what we're doing. That's why we are building these buildings is to bring the residential downtown. By bringing the residential downtown, you have the best shot at supporting the businesses that can thrive in 2021, 2022, 2025. And I think that the residential, uh, the, the residents that we brought downtown in Kendrick and One East Pleasant have helped support the downtown businesses um, I think the residents of 11 East Pleasant will continue to do that. Um, and I think that um, um, I can I can answer anything else, Jack, that, that I may have missed. Yeah, I guess, I mean, one thing I hadn't really mentioned was, was you know, um, the parking. And I know that you're concerned about the parking in downtown as well, long, long, long range. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, but I mean, when we did the site visit, we saw, you know, quite a few people coming out of one East Pleasant Street to get into their car, which was parked on the on the subject parcel um, there. So there's going to be, you know, and we, we've gotten a lot of different mixed messages uh, not from developers. We just had a developer that was looking one to one for parking for some residential style apartments there on, on College Street. And then we have others that that they don't not necessarily that came before us, but they we know there are apartments out there that have zero parking and they're they're all full. All the all the apartments are are, are rented. Um, but we we are losing quite a few, and you you've already removed some. You removed some from Spring Street as well. And I'm just I, I'm I'm just wondering if there's there's a tipping point here. Um, and if, is there a short-term solution that, that could ease or, I mean, it, it, it you know, it, it is a complicated one. And it's not just your problem, it's, it's you know, the town's problem. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say this, Jack, that yeah. we're happy to be replacing parking lots with housing um, I think that that's housing is what you need downtown. I think housing long term is the thing that's going to drive a thriving uh, streetscape. Um, I think that the parking conundrum is something that communities around the country are dealing with. Um, I think if it's a question of will these apartments be rented without parking, the answer is absolutely because the demand is so high because Amherst has been so far behind on the housing production that it needs to achieve. So parking does not determine if the apartment is rented. I think that, I think, you know, um, the municipal parking district that the town implemented in the 50s was extremely progressive. And, you know, the reason that the town uh, approved, town meeting approved a five story buildings instead of four was that same progressive approach, which is understanding that you need to have some density downtown to make it thrive when your downtown is as small as ours is. So <clears throat> I think that the parking issue is real. I think that parking across the country is going 
is, is being questioned because people realize that adding structured parking increases rents. It increases construction costs. It increases rents. We have a rent issue in this town. Um, we have a house price issue in this town. Those are going to continue um, until we build the new units that we need to build. So we have to choose, do you want parking or units? And mm. I think that what we've chosen on this last iteration is the units uh, drive more economic development, bring people downtown and are better um, uh, for, uh, I think what Amherst is trying to do with the municipal parking district. And you know, I wanna be careful here, but I'm just throwing it out here because it's bounced around in my head a little bit. I, I mentioned it to Chris, but you, you are paving the pub parcel. And I know that's not a long-term vision, but, um, and that's not part of this project other than a staging area, but just wondered if you had any thoughts about making that available for, you know, a short-term sort of thing. And would that, you know, does that make any sense to you as a developer? Um, I, I think that um, we have not thought about making that into a parking lot. Um, I think that it is. Uh, so I think that's probably all I'd want to say there. I, I don't, I don't okay. think it's, it's well suited to be a parking lot. I think it works very well for construction staging and allowing us to build a complex project in a unique urban, you know, downtown site. Um, but beyond that, I don't see that that little tucked in parcel that is the pub is an optimal parking spot behind the laundromat and behind the bank and next to our building. Good. Uh, and uh, Doug and then Janet. All right. Um, first question uh, for, for Kyle. I, I noticed you said you were going to have a trash compactor. And, uh, and I was noticing that that trash room the the exterior facade or exterior wall of it is uh, right next to that very narrow walkway with the fight with the bollards along it mm -hmm. and i guess i was just puzzled whether uh, you know i'm not familiar with whole building trash compactors but i can imagine that the trash once compacted is actually very heavy and potentially large and and how do you get the trash out of that room and down that really narrow north edge of the building to the truck? Uh, well, the trash would come right out and it would fit in between the bollards and the building. So the compactors are not, it's not like something you'd see at UMass. They're, you know, a smaller thing that can get picked up and tossed. It's not like the big ones that are currently behind the Cousins Market right now. So okay. they can fit in that location. All right. Uh, and then the next thing was, uh, a lot of buildings like this would at least have a a place for a delivery van for FedEx and Amazon to to park uh, for a short time when they're making deliveries to the building. Um, you know, have you thought about? I mean, your site plan doesn't show any delivery short-term parking, and you know, it doesn't show any ADA parking. Um, you know, how do you? How do you comply with those things? Well, that's that stuff we've we've gone through with Spring Street in the past, right? If you're not if you're not providing parking, um, you know what does that mean? Um, and I think we've resolved those. I think in this case we have an easement uh, that serves this parcel, that serves other parcels, that is available to us, and I think would be our uh, would be used as our delivery uh, and pickup location. Okay. And then last, I guess this is a question for Chris. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the public comment has urged us to uh, increase the setback along the street edge, and and I guess my question is, would we have the authority to increase to require Archipelago to increase the setback along? East Pleasant Street beyond what is stated as the requirement in our bylaw. Chris, you're on mute. Um, yes, you have the authority to, to ask for that. Um, 
Archipelago is asking you for special permits. They're asking for an increase in height. They're asking for a lessening of the side setback on the north side of the building. And they're asking for um, a change to the setback on, on the east side of the building. So you can negotiate with them about things that you want in exchange for things that they want. It's a conversation. And I think that that's perfectly reasonable to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Janet? Doug, I'm super excited by that question um, because when I sent out the, um, you know, standards, the permit, the zoning bylaw, you know, the site plan review bylaw, permit requirements and special permit and de design review. So section 10.4 of our bylaw allows, gives the planning board the power to impose conditions, right? We do this all the time. Um, we can change the setback, the side and rear yards greater than the minimum required by the bylaw. You know, we can, we can do, we can limit the size and the number of occupants, the method and time of op occupation. So the, the planning board actually has the power to do that. And, you know, I think it's probably best practice to negotiate and work it out, but we could at some point just say, you know, you wanted 10 feet, you know, five feet and, you know, and we think that's too narrow. We're going to set that at eight feet, you know, on the, you know, the side setback and things like that. So, um, you know, and obviously you don't want to put something in that's going to cripple the building, but also I think what we're trying to do is make it a better building um, with different interests than, than the developer. But so I just want to say that, but actually I have a question. That's the first question that Jack asked, which is, I was trying to figure out who owns the building like who owns it now and who will own it. And so I went onto the property card and it was Summerlin Trust who is owned, I went onto the state website and that's somebody who lives on an island in South Carolina, which sounds lovely. And then, um, so I'm wondering if Mr. Wilson could tell us like, so is, is Mr. Summerlin who applied for a demolition permit for these buildings last year and got it, is he going to own this building? Are you going to own it? Is, you know, Harrison Street funding this and going to buy it? Like, what? Who? Who's the owner of the building? Because you're you're looking for a permit, but I don't know who's going to own the building. Uh, Kyle. Uh, well, Laird Summerlin, his family has owned it for generations. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Laird Summerlin's a fixture in the community. He's been here for a while and is now down in South Carolina. Um, uh, 11 East Pleasant LLC will own the building. And so that's owned by the Harrison Street. No, that, that, that it, each project has, is its own LLC that has its own uh, structure and on every project. Every project is a special purpose LLC. So if I went onto the state corporations website, they would tell me who the principals are for that then. Okay, I'll go look. They that. would once we buy the building, which we Summerlin Trust currently owns. Okay, thank, that's all I wanted to know because I was unclear about that. And then the other question I have is probably not a great topic after me bringing up a whole bunch of not great topics. So on One East Pleasant, you have this good restaurant on one side and there was gonna be another restaurant on the other side that for whatever reason didn't open. And so <laughs> I'm just wondering- Maybe about, a global pandemic. Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, I look at North Square and I think, you know, could it be worse? And so. It's not a criticism, but I'm just wondering, like, is it the pandemic? Is it the problem with the location or it's the person opening the restaurant fell through? And, you know, like what's, you know, what are some options? Because the space is built out as a restaurant as I remember right now. So the like, space is em the space is empty and the space received a building permit today for a okay. new, a new establishment on the ground floor. Okay, so it was built out as a restaurant at one point. Though. It's not built out, it's empty. Okay, maybe I just maybe I was looking at the wrong restaurant. Okay, thank you. So there is Aya sushi is obviously operating and yeah. uh, in operation. So maybe I was peering through the wrong window. So that's great. So there's something coming in then. That's great to hear. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, now Maria, please. Oh, what, what, at what point can we talk about that right of way? Is it too early in the process as far as discussing the town improvements? Uh, sorry, the improvements to the town property and the sidewalk. Uh, maybe that's a question for Chris or Rob as far as this Chris? project and that process. I don't think it's too early. No, I think this is a good oh. time to talk about it. Yeah. 
Okay, so I guess um, I assume we're continuing because we're waiting on a few things like photometrics and fire department went up. So could we request like, I mean, would that be something that Archipelago's designers present something or is that something that uh, is a collaboration between the town and our, like how do we um, have something to respond to as far as, you know, the right of way improvements? I think Archipelago should present something. Um, I think relying on the DPW at this point, they're very busy to uh, come up with a design is not, um, it's not gonna be timely. So um, mm -hmm. yes, Archipelago can present something and you can respond to it. Because um, you guys have shown the crosswalk already. Is that too much of an ask <clears throat> or uh, what next time we meet to get some sort of proposal on, on that portion of the project? Uh, we, we are obviously more than willing to propose um, improvements. I think that what we found in the past is that that process of approving those improvements has delayed our building permit, which has negatively impacted, impacted projects. So what we've tried to do with this project is say we would love to support whatever improvements need to occur on the east side at the cemetery, on the west side at the street, and then come up with some vehicle where all of the interested parties that want to uh, opine on that and determine what should go out there and where, what it should look like and what height and material and all that stuff can occur outside of the process of, of us trying to build the building and get it a building permit and, and proceed with it. So um, I, I have no problem presenting it. We've chosen not to, we'd like to continue to choose not to and say, come up with some vehicle to say, whatever the town comes up with, we'd like to build that for you and, and be outside of that conversation so that we are not the ones leading that. And, so that the, those improvements can occur outside of the, uh, the critical timing to trying to get a building like this built. Um, if you don't mind, Jack, I think it would be great to call on Rob because he's the one who has to kind of see a project through to the end. And I know he's had a lot of trouble in the past getting developers to do what they say they're gonna do, particularly with regard to right of way issues. So Rob may have some words of wisdom on this. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, um, I guess my suggestion or response to, to Kyle's uh, thought there is that perhaps the uh, the conditions that have been troubling for him in the past to, to have the permit issued, the building permits issued uh, in, a, in a timely manner according to his schedule might be the way we address that rather than just saying, let's not include it right now. Because I think for at least from what I've heard so far, there are issues that have to be resolved. One really small, simple one is where's the bike rack going to go? And if we don't address that now or have the developer address that now, potentially in the right of way, perhaps there's no choice but to say, make more room in front of your building so that you can put your bike rack there, which is what you're designing now. So it seems like, and that's just one of the issues, it seems like um, I'd rather, I'd suggest rather see that the developer work on that area and we try to craft a condition that doesn't cause whatever problem the conditions have caused in the past. Uh, Kyle, just, I just, I have a side question then you can respond, but there's no internal bike storage within the building right now? There is. There is, okay, I, I thought so, all right. All right, so yeah, you uh, want to respond, so, Rob? Uh, I, I, I appreciate that. I think if we could resolve it in a way that's not tied to the issuance of the building permit, that would allow us to do all the things we have to do to get open. I think that in terms of deciding the design that goes out there, um, is there some way for us to not be the only leader of that? Uh, um, so that, is there a bond or something that we could issue that, that, that says we are you know, gonna pay X number of dollars towards whatever improvements are finalized through whatever committees and conversations and meetings and second meetings and fifth meetings that have to occur to, to finalize stuff? Probably I would say yes. Yeah. Yep. Rob I'm, and I can think about what would be an appropriate condition to work this out. And I'd be open to that on the east side as well, working with Alan Snow and you know, the, you know, what we proposed is, is now keeping the fence where it is, pulling the building back, planting trees on our side. We'd like to proceed on that. Um, if there's other opinions, 
that that involve moving the fence and putting plants on the other side, we'd like to be able to still be able to proceed with the building and not take have those take a number of months to finalize every single question before we uh, would potentially be able to proceed. So may I make a suggestion that Kyle meet with Rob and me to work something out? Sounds good. Uh, Janet? Um, so I wonder if, like, it sounded like Maria had some ideas. So I wonder if maybe um, if people have ideas of what they think that space could be and like what would activate it. So, you know, having a sidewalk and a strip of grass, not so exciting. You know, when I look across the street, I see gardens and benches and, you know, there's a lot of people lingering around and, you know, a place for someone to sell their succulents. And so Maria, do you have specific ideas of what could be there? I wonder if some of the members might want to say, just jump in with some ideas. Maria? I, I honestly haven't thought hard enough about it right now. I, um, so uh, I'm, I'm welcome anyone else want to chime in. Uh, there were some ideas. I kind of like, uh, this is not my field of expertise though. Um, <laughs> Oh, Joanna. Off the top of my head, gardens, benches, bike parking. Um, you know, I think there there's cool stuff you can do with like creating spaces where people hang out that also have architectural elements. I just, I think about where we used to live in Munich where there were these like, they were just like cubes and kids would bounce on the cubes. And yeah, I, you know, I don't know that we want to have that right next to the street, but I think um, there are a lot of cool things we could do. Yeah. Gardens. Uh, you know, like that, that space in front of Xana and the toy box, like they are beautiful perennial gardens and there's, you know, I think there might even be a chessboard up there now or something. So there's, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that that's exactly the right spot and there is a park across the way, but I think there are some good ideas. And then in, being in the right of way that the town or the bid would end up taking care of that or, or would that be, who would that uh, go to, Chris? Who would that be in oh, um, DPW would take care of it if it's in okay. the right of way, yep. All right. Doug. Yeah, Kyle, I was wondering, would it be feasible in the space that you've configured for retail that that would ever be a food establishment? You're on mute. There. It could be, yes. OK, so um, you know, I think it's worth thinking about whether, you know, a lot of the food establishments in town in the last year and a half have found it advantageous to spill out onto the sidewalk. And, um, you know, the way things are configured right now, there's not very much room for that to happen, I guess. So uh, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, I hate to set back the retail edge because that decreases the square footage of the retail space. Um, but I guess you've got the side entrance, but you know your residents are walking up and down that strip. Well, and and this could be identical to the space between the sidewalk and the curb at Antonio. I mean. That was the big granite things and the chains and and that gets the public as safe as possible out as close to the road as they possibly can, right? It's obviously yeah. not a garden or plantings, right? right? But it's mm -hmm. it's a more urban, you know, spill out in the streets, post-COVID uh, outdoor dining situation, right? So we're open to that as well, right? We don't have a strong preference. We're open to three street trees and a bike rack if the bike storage inside isn't sufficient. We're open to street trees with a type of benching around it if the seating there is, is found to be 
appropriate that close to the street and that close to the sidewalk. Um, but we don't want to spend a month trying to design all of those elements and specify the granite curbing and the size of the chain um, in order to proceed on the building. So I'm, I'm trying to just come up with a way to have right. those things run concurrently and we're open to it. Like if, if the plan board said, hey, we want this to look just like Bertucci's. Okay, let's do that. Hey, we want this to look just like uh, the improvements around the roundabout at Kendrick Place. You know, we'd be open to that as well. Okay. Well, the main the main elements that come to my mind are a bike rack for for visitors to the building, whether it's to the residents or to the retail, and then uh, some effort to start to widen the sidewalk in that strip. Uh, you know, just to start to say this is going to be a more uh, inhabited sidewalk than just a pure vehicle, you know, passage for pedestrians to be, keep walking. Um, I think also that the presence of that crosswalk uh, probably complicates efforts to, uh, it, I think the crosswalk complicates efforts to activate that area for a garden or for sitting, but uh, I guess we'll see. Uh, I think the crosswalk, you could, the seating you could do either side. You could, with the crosswalk in its location is driven by the Eversource and, you know, underground stuff on the west side. You could put tree, one tree to the south of the crosswalk and two trees to the north, right? And think about where the bike rack goes within that. Um, or again, those street trees could be all in pavers and there could be granite posts and the chains if we wanted to go for more of an outdoor dining, everybody aggregate here type of place with a park across the street. Great. Um, any other comments, questions? Um, uh, just yes, Jack, sorry. Um, I, I'm open to meeting with Rob and Chris, so I can do that. I think what it seems like to me might be the best approach is to make some, uh, to draw something um, that is a, a start that sees that that's close enough to allow us to proceed, right? That may have trees associated with it, may have a bike rack, may have a bench. Um, and and maybe I'll take that to the meeting with Rob and Chris and we can see if we can go from there. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Good, good. good. Um, so um, uh, would we take, um, oh, Chris, where'd you, all right. Um, would we take, uh, Public comment again, based on what this discussion it's it's on the uh, it's on the preamble, but I don't recall that's protocol. But um, well, you did already take public comment. Um, yeah, and I don't it's see just, anyone I, hands up. So yeah. uh, you know, I think you could just conclude your discussion tonight, and then give the developer. Um, a list of things that you'd like him to follow up on. And I have something that I need to follow up on with Joel Bard. And <clears throat> then you could determine that you want to continue this public hearing to a date certain. Okay. So should we, we work on that list? We've, I know, you know, Doug went over quite a bit, you know, with regard to the uh, preliminary decision. Um, or do you want to do you, um, how do you want to handle that because it's there, there's there's a lot of things and i'm not the greatest note taker but um well i know the things that i have to do i have to um come up with a potential list of conditions and findings mm -hmm. in case you decide that you want to approve this building i need to contact joel bard and ask him to help us to sort out um how section 9.22 um, will be treated or will either support or not support what's being proposed. Um, so those are things that I need to do. I think you've asked the developer to um, come back with a plan for uh, how to treat the, um, for the right of way. Yeah. Um, and some of you have asked him for um, ideas about how to expand the 
the front, the area in front of the building to make it more usable. Yeah. Um, but kind of the potential for more retail on, on the uh, south side of the building. Potential for more retail on south side. The rear setback um, going from 10 to 20. Um, the cemetery are you, fence. Are you asking him to um, make the setback um, 20 instead of 10? Or are you asking him to think about it? Consider? Think about it. Yeah, I think just think about it. <laughs> um, Jack, just really quick, I just want to state yes. once again that a 20 foot setback means fewer units also fewer affordable units. Mm -hmm. We could do a, a straw poll on that particular issue, uh, but I see some hands up, Janet, and then Doug. So in terms of like future discussion, I've been sort of um, not talking about like the building look and things like that. And it, it makes sense to me to save that for after the design review board and that will come back to us. So I, that's a, that seems like a huge issue to me. Um, and I know um, people will differ, um, but I really, and so I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, I, overall, I think we've got favorable response from the, from the architects on the, on the board here. Also a follow up that meeting yeah. for the public for everybody is uh, July 19th, that's a Monday from 5 to 7 p.m. Okay. For the design review board. I, When's the, oh, I just Kyle? wanted to suggest, can I, I make, just make a suggestion yeah. that if people have comments that they wanted to make about the way the building looks, it might be helpful to make them now because it might be a while before you get back together and to have the applicant sort of, you know, coming back after a while and then being hit with other things that are problems. I think that's going to be difficult. So um, I would, I guess I would suggest that you, you know, state your issues tonight and then the applicant can go away and consider whether he wants to respond to what you've said or have a reason why he's not going to respond to what you said. So anyway, I'll be quiet now. So I'll let you think about that, Janet and Doug. All right, I, uh, uh, for your list, I think we also need to hear from the fire department. And then okay. uh, I guess I am generally satisfied with the look of the building. Um, I am, I, I, I think in the last meeting where this was, the earlier version was discussed, I had some questions about the durability and kind of how the weathering of that wood would would hold up over time. Uh, I guess I still have those concerns, but I assume that if you end up having a building that starts to look bad, you might do something about it. Um, so I'll leave that really to you. Um, I like the combination of the wood and the zinc. Um, you know, I think the way the facade has been arranged is uh, sort of interesting and inconsistent enough to be, uh, you know, not so boring and regular. So I like that. Um, I, I, what I was originally going to talk about was whether, you know, my colleagues on the board, if, if everybody's fine with the building being out at a zero setback from the property line along the street. Um, cause obviously just as, uh, at the Eastern end, if we it required a larger setback, if we required a larger setback at the Western end, that's going to re reduce the number of units as well. Um, I think given, given my interest in having more housing downtown and the adjacency of one East Pleasant street and proximity of Kendrick park. Um, I am probably just fine. I think I would accept the zero setback. Uh, I did ask about the, the restaurant and use and, and if there were a high likelihood of it being a restaurant, I might feel differently that you needed a little more room out there in the front for potential outdoor dining and for people to kind of meet each other and gather before they went into the restaurant. 
but I don't, it's not clear that that's really the way this small retail space would be headed. So if anybody has any other comments about the front setback, I think that would be, that's not dependent on a legal interpretation as the Eastern end is. Um, so we could, we could decide that now if we wanted to, it's, or if we wanted to change it. Yeah. So it's, it's a zero offset only on the Northwest corner. And then, but, and it's recessed on the, well, the upper floors are out. Oh, upper zero. floor, yeah, but okay. So it's the mass of the building that I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, Kyle, you had your hand up, and then Janet. Uh, I can wait and, and grab everything. Okay, <laughs> Janet, and um, then Maria. It's hard. It's hard for me to give any opinion on the setback. Um, you know, basically, I think it should go back, but I also think if we're if the front, the sidewalk is being used or enlarged, that's going to change my feeling on that. And so I don't, I don't have a really strong visual sense of what that could look like. Um, anyway, um, I'm just going to say the building, the look of the building. And so, um, I don't think it would be a, a surprise to people to hear that many, many people in town find the other buildings way too big and imposing. And um, they kind of loom and they're very tall and they're kind of very um, same, like uh, the facades are all very the same. And so, and they're very big in comparison to all the other buildings around and, you know, in the, in the area, not just in regard to each other, but the buildings that are there and across from Kendrick Park in the neighborhood. So um, at the design review board, um, some of the members had talked about the blank wall, like this just long wall that you're looking at and on both sides. And, um, and so that got me thinking about how do you break that up? And so, you know, part of the mixed use building standards and the BL, I can't remember the 40R are all talking about like, you know, you change the contours of the building. I wondered if the building had two colors, like, you know, the first and second floor are one and just to make it look less big. I think smaller windows not only would make it look less like the same and giant, but actually would be nicer for the tenants that they could actually have the windows open and not their entire body seen. But I also think if there were smaller windows, um, it would be kind of more interesting to me and it'd be more fitting into the style of local windows. Um, Steve Schreiber had suggested for um, North Square that it was actually really big for the area and then putting the, the top floor into kind of a roof. And so that, that would sort of um, change the way it looked and kind of, you know, whatever. So that's, I'm thinking about that idea. And I just think that, you know, the building is kind of boxy and overwhelming. And from the sides, it just looks like just, you know, it doesn't look like a New England town, which also made me wonder about, I know you really like the cedar siding and what if it was sideways? So it kind of references clabbered more like something to make it look fit, not to fit in with its surroundings and stuff, to kind of bring it down to a scale. So when you're in Kender Park, you're not just looking up at these giant facades, and then you're looking at, you know, these beautiful buildings, you know, old colonial buildings. There has to be some way to integrate that. And so, um, I think the design review board will be talking about stuff like that. But I didn't want to spring it as a surprise in three weeks or something. But there's, I mean, it's a general feeling amongst many people that these buildings just kind of pop out and they're too big. I know this building is smaller, but you know, it didn't, you know, I, how do you make it smaller or feel smaller for someone standing on the street or looking across the street or actually looking at it from the graveyard? Like I took my friends to the graveyard after we went to the Emily Dickens Museum, my Boston friends, and we just turned around and looked at, the, you know, when he's pleasant and our mouths kind of dropped open. And I think that is part of the thing. It's just, it's just a lot of building and it's really big and it looks, you know, it's everything about it is big and the same. So, um, and I know I'm not an architect and whatever, but I'm just, I'm just getting in there and saying what I hear and some of the things I've kind of picked up looking around at other buildings. So thank you. Jana, that, that's very impressive for not being an architect, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> just drive around around looking at buildings, I have pictures. Yeah. Um, Maria, please. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, that's a tricky thing. It's very subjective. There's not really right and wrong. Um, but as far as just thinking of it as a planner, I mean, I'm not a planner, but thinking of it in that way, um, seeing the perspectives helps show that, you know, what they're trying to continue is the street edge and the scale as far as density and massing. And I, I think they've done a nice job of that. 
on both the street side as well as the long facades, which is always a tricky thing to break up. And um, they've done exactly that with the material changes and with the variations in the windows. So um, it's always misleading to look at ex exterior elevations too. They're very abstract, they've flattened everything. Once you get a building of three dimensions of shadows and see sort of what is pushing and pulling as far as the facade, it's a completely different look. So these long flat elevations always make buildings look very stark. So um, the three-dimensional images really help. And um, what was my point? Uh, let's see. Um, oh, so as far as recommendations, um, I think the only thing is, yeah, make sure that cedar, uh, I think you, Kyle, in one of the earlier meetings mentioned something about a different wood species and stain that you're gonna be trying out. So that's something that would be great because um, your detail shot shows really lovely siding that would be great to keep. Um, and I, I appreciate that you didn't just build another brick and stucco. Um, you know, this is a different material and, um, but it keeps the same streetscape. So um, I, I personally, uh, I'm excited to see it in reality. And um, I thought I had a more specific point, but I'm forgetting it now. So, but anyways, that I, I think we just wanted to weigh in. Oh, well that I remember now. I don't think that we should be encroaching any more on setbacks because we're trying to, as many of people said, bring more housing downtown. And the more we push and pull this building smaller, the more that's you know obviously going away. So I think at this point, maybe talk more about streetscape, about how it interacts with people at the human scale. But we just need as many units as we can get and. Um, uh, yeah, uh, increasing the setbacks is definitely not the direction to go in, in my opinion. So I think you were trying to do a straw poll, so that, that's why I was chiming in with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i thinking like, if People's Bank wasn't there, you know, what would that next property, you know, look like? Would it, you know, would it, probably at that, at that point, at some point, you kind of really want to do a lot of interesting things. Um, because you know, I, you wouldn't want a steady five-story wall going from one from Kendrick Place to One East Pleasant, but but we need the housing. You know, there, there will be multi-story buildings, sort of thing. But um, my my understanding from what Maria said that that you this the the facade again. I'm not an architect, but it's significantly different and breaks things up quite a bit. Um, and so I'm I'm just kind of deferring to the other experts here on the on the planning board in that respect. Um, so what do people think about in terms of you know giving them uh, giving them a punch list? Should we do you know a straw poll or do they have enough? Kyle, do you have enough that, that you can kind of uh, you, you know you're going to get feedback from the design review board. Um, Personally, I, I think it's, you know, keeping the cemetery fence where it is seems like a smart, smart thing. I wouldn't uh, I'd get nervous going up there digging on the grave, on the cemetery property there, moving a fence and all that. Um, and it seems like you can achieve the, you know, what you need to do back there. Um, if you put the trees on, on the, on the west end of the fence versus west side of the fence versus moving the fence, but that's, uh, anybody have any strong feelings about that? Uh, Doug? Yeah, I guess I was, I was uh, on board with the proposal that seemed to be the consensus with the developer and the historic commission to, to take down the trees that are right on the property line and move the fence to the property line mm -hmm. so that it's you know so that the town can fully maintain its property and and they don't have to access town property through the archipelago property um i mean i didn't think that was really something that we were revisiting but so i'm your your comment surprised me I'm just listening to, to Kyle. I mean, it, I mean, I think anybody yeah. else have a feeling on that? The, the, if I can just say one other thing bef before I give up the floor, 
uh, if I heard Tom right, the design review board doesn't meet until July 19th. And, and I think, isn't our next meeting on this before that? Not necessarily. You haven't decided when your next meeting is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was going to ask the same question. Please. We would have to set, you know, a continuance. Um, look at the schedule. Uh, well, let me hit on the, the cemetery side while Doug brought that question up. Um, and uh, we do not have a strong preference. If there was a preference here to move the fence and give Alan and the DPW more room to work on the West Cemetery, that's fine. Um, we think that there should be trees on our property line either way. I think that that's something that you know we're willing to plant, we're willing to maintain and pay for. So I think we should put those up on our side. If Alan wants, we we have no intention of planting any plants on the town's property. So if Alan wants to to do that subsequent and create a second level, that would be fine. And he would be able to do that if we did if the fence was moved for our extent, basically from the Gaylord Gate piece of granite that turns the corner all the way to the north end of the 11 east pleasant street property so it would remain as it is on the jones property north of here and on the 15 east pleasant mm -hmm. but we can move it on the on the uh, property in question okay so that doesn't really require for the discussion uh so at this point should we just, I think you have enough material, uh, Kyle and, and Chris, maybe you can help us kind of wrap through, up. I can go through my notes and send, um, send something out maybe tomorrow. On okay. Exactly what we talked about following up yeah. on. But I think we've got a pretty good idea of it. Do you want me to talk to you about dates, potential dates? Yes, yes. So the planning board is meeting on... Um, July 7th, and it's already got a full schedule on July 7th. It's meeting on July 14th with the specific purpose of talking about zoning mm -hmm. among itself. It's meeting on July 21st to talk with the CRC to hold public hearings on four zoning amendments. And the next meeting that is scheduled is August 4th. Okay. So I would recommend continuing this public hearing to August 4th. That sounds appropriate. Uh, Janet, and Kyle, well, Kyle first thing. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would request if we could be on for July 14th, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, skipping an entire month uh, is very difficult if we're gonna try to actually build this project. So, um, if we could get before the DRB and get before the planning board for July 14th, it would give us a chance. If we extend this to August 4th, you know, the reality is we're probably not going to get a signature until September. If we have a chance to try to dig a hole, it's, you know, there's, there's real timing here. And, um, you know, this is, you know, the original submittal for this has been in for, for a while here. So we, if, if we could, if we could be on the July 14th planning board meeting, that would, we would greatly appreciate that. May I say something? Yeah, we got the design review board to meet so, the 19th. Design review board on the 19th, yeah. And the planning board um, really needs to talk about the zoning amendments before the public hearing. And that was something that, um, you know, people talked about in the beginning of this meeting. So I think the planning board does not want to give up that ability to talk about those zoning amendments on the 14th. Um, they're, you know, so anyway, I think the 14th is going to be completely subsumed with talking about zoning amendments. These things go on forever um, when we've talked to the CRC about them and also talking to the planning board in the past about them. It just takes a long time. And we also get a lot of public comments. So I think having it on the 14th is really not reasonable. On the 21st, as I said, we have four joint public hearings with the CRC. It's possible that the planning board could um, schedule another meeting between July 21st and August 4th, which would be what? July 28th. So the planning board could schedule a meeting for July 28th just for this project. 
if you all are willing to do that. Jack? Yeah, I'm just looking. Yeah, yes, Janet. I, I can't understand for the life of me why we're going to have a formal statutory public hearing on four zoning amendments on July 21st when we haven't talked about two of them. And I, I don't know where that schedule came from. And I don't know why. We're that... going to talk about that after this. Yeah, so I would happily swap the July 21st for talking more about archipelago and moving that to a date when we actually have seen the bylaw amendments and made comments and worked on them or had some information about them. I mean, it's, it's shocking. I'm completely shocked by the 21st. And I can't even imagine doing four zoning amendments that we've just talked about once before. Two of them once, I don't even think we've talked about some of them. So I, I would happily meet, do the archipelago on the 21st and figure out you know, when the amendments are ready to go or what ones are and what our process is. I think that's in our hands. And if the CRC wants to hold a hearing, they can, but I don't, I don't even understand how we got here. Uh, Chris, then Doug. Well, I think we got here because we've been talking about this um, since January. We've been talking about zoning amendments since January. And this is um, a schedule that has been worked out with the president of the town council and the um, chair of the CRC. And I am sorry that uh, Jack feels like he wasn't on board with that schedule. So um, that's my error in communication. But um, I, re I really feel like it would work to have the planning board meet on the 14th and discuss the zoning amendments and then have a public hearing on the 21st. You can always continue the public hearing if you don't reach a conclusion. Um, but it seems like this is the right schedule. Rob Mora has been working with me on this and he may have some comments or suggestions to make about this, but that, that would be my recommendation. Okay, uh, Doug? Yeah, I, I, I am comfortable with us talking as a board about these amendments for one meeting before we have the joint hearing and whether it's on the 14th or the 7th doesn't really matter to me. Um, I guess I, what I was also gonna ask was whatever, whatever the agenda is on the 7th, could we flip that with our, I mean, you know, could we talk about the zoning amendments on the 7th, talk about Archipelago's project on the 14th and flip whatever's on the agenda for the 7th to August 4th. Uh, that's all. Well, there's a practical um, consideration, which is I'm gonna be out of town. So the 7th is already kind of locked in. And we have uh, the CVS parking lot. You have the CVS parking lot and you have um, Greenfield Savings Bank on the 7th, and those two have been advertised. They're public hearings, they've been advertised. Which we have no information on other than, I mean, no data, no background. We've never talked about it. We what, only the, the rezoning, you've never talked about? That was brought to the town council and referred to the planning board for a public hearing, so. We, but we have 65 days to hold it and I just don't understand that I just, this is a different agenda item, but I just don't get it. I don't get how we got here or why we're here or what the rush is and why we are talking, holding public hearings when we're completely not ready. Well, as I said earlier, you can continue a public hearing if you feel like you're not ready to come to a conclusion about it. I don't feel ready to have the public hearing. I don't, I don't know if I'm the only person here would like to see and get information and ask questions and discuss things, but I, I just don't get it. I don't, we seem to have just gone off the rails in terms of the procedure we agreed to. I don't know, but I guess we, you know, I mean, I think we could do archipelago in July and move at least up to August. It's not set in stone. I, I think the design review board would have valuable input and that's the 19th. And I mean, how, how locked in is that Tom?
it, it's pretty locked in. I mean, we did have a date prior to that that we had to cancel. I think it was the week before um, because we wouldn't have a quorum. So we had to push it to the 19th. So it's new information, but it's pretty locked in in terms of scheduling and who's available. Yeah. So I think um, I, I, it sounds like we really, we, we can't really do it much sooner than, than August, Kyle. Sorry, uh, you wanna speak? Please. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask if we could get a DRB before July 19th, um, please. Um, and saying that we resubmitted this, this new proposal, um, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and first submitted this on in February. So if we could do that, that would be greatly appreciated. I'm just here to, to reveal the, the pressures that are on a project like this to try to execute and deliver. Um, and those are very real. So if we do get pushed beyond a number of public hearings and we're not talking until August 4th, then the likelihood that this project can proceed is significantly limited if we lose a month and a half every time we have another hearing, which has been the case here. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to adapt into an environment that's changing in terms of the bylaws that affect our building. We're trying to keep an existing property owner um, moving forward. We're trying to invest in downtown, um, but we have to do that in on a schedule. We can't have a month and a half between every meeting. And um, it's, it's just, it, it puts a lot of unnecessary pressure on, I think, a business that's trying to, you know, invest a significant amount of money in downtown. So if we could if we could meet DRB before and do planning board on the 14th, I would greatly appreciate it. So the reality is that um, we've sent out legal ads for July 21st for the planning board to meet with the CRC about four zoning amendments. Um, I can pull those back tomorrow, um, but this is really throwing a monkey wrench into the plans for the summer. I mean, the planning board, the fact is the planning board has a lot of things on its plate. The planning board and the planning department and the um, building inspector have been working hard on zoning amendments for the last six months. Um, we have to work in concert with the town council and the CRC. We can't just you know, go on our own schedule. Um, and this is the schedule that's been, uh, you know, given to us. So I, I'm at a loss to figure this out. I, uh, my recommendation would be to hold a public hearing on, um, to continue this to July 28th. Um, but maybe, you know, we'd have to find out who's available then. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I think if the design review board can can uh, do something. I don't think they can. To, I, I, I really uh, don't think they can. I think Maureen has tried really hard to get the design review board together in the month of July. And mm -hmm. what she's come up with is July 19th. So um, I just, I don't know. Rob, do you have any suggestions? Uh, j just to, you know, confirm that. I mean, I did speak with Maureen earlier today and and I know she, it took her a while to get dates available with the DRB to have a quorum and the 19th was the soonest date uh, that she could get together. You know, we asked for the soonest date. And, I, and I'll just add that, you know, we have to give her a reasonable amount of time to prepare the recommendations to deliver to the planning board. So, you know, meeting on the 21st will not give her enough time to do that. Yeah. I, I would have to say, Kyle, that the, the planning board has been very amenable in terms of meeting as often as is required to, to, to help this initiative with the zoning bylaws. And, and then, you know, we, we've, you know, you, you changed your design. I mean, that's, I think it's, it's great that, that you did that, but it's, you did that, not us. And so that was a month and a half there. Um, um, I don't know what to say. I mean, it, it looks like uh, the August, what did you say, July? July 28th. Do you want to take a straw poll to see who's available on July 28th? 
Yeah, because that that is that is not a scheduled day for us. So we'll, we'll be meeting every week in July, basically. That's right. Um, so uh, Doug and then Janet. I, I believe I could be available on the 28th, although I'd be calling in from wherever I'm vacationing. Um, I guess I was also, or I raised my hand to say, should we try to do a marathon session on the 21st and start at say 4.30 and go give ourselves an hour before dinner with Archipelago and then, uh, you know, do the regular agenda after dinner. So, but, but it sounds like, but it, it did sound like Rob didn't think that would give Maureen enough time to collect the comments from the DRB. I'm, I didn't, did the DRB not meet on the original proposal? They met on the original proposal and they gave their recommendations to Kyle. And I think they also, I'm not sure if they gave them to us or not. Um, so, I, so I guess part of the, I guess I can ask, is this proposal so different that the DRB comments are likely to be significant? I think it's going to be a different level of detail that we're going to be focused on this time. And last time it was much more of an open discussion, um, more of a feedback cycle. This time we're going to be going um, line by line through the design guidelines and how and criteria and how this building meets or does not meet those. Um, so I have a feeling there's going to be a lot more detail uh, involved in this particular phase of the process. So again, I know it puts a lot of extra work on um, on on Maureen and the planning board, our uh, planning department, um, to to squeeze that into two days. I think Maureen can get comments to the planning board by. 21st I believe she's going on vacation after the 19th anyway so if the DRB meets on the 19th and we take Doug's suggestion of having a marathon night on the 21st starting at 4 30 I don't really think we'll get a break though because the zoning amendments are scheduled to start at 6 30 so okay okay oh Janet I I, I think I don't see any urgency in having a public hearing on the parking bylaw revisions. I don't know what the urgency of that is anyway. We haven't talked about it in any detail. We have no data on parking needs um, at mixed use buildings versus townhouses versus apartments. There's no urgency to revise the apartments de definition. We haven't done any analysis of where apartments could be, how big they could be, how many people, you know, the whole thing. How does that interact with changing the, the parking requirements? We have no analysis. And I, I can't imagine that on the 21st, we need to talk about that and we'll talk, or we can and talk about it intelligently. It's not gonna take pressure off the planning department. We don't have any information. We haven't done any of this work. So I would just lift those two off. I'm sure we can talk about mixed use intelligently. We started, we had a good discussion of it. We didn't come to any conclusions. Um, I don't know why the town council is sending this to us when we have, you know, I, I, I don't know how we got here, but I don't know what the pressure is for parking bylaw revisions or apartments definitions that we haven't discussed and we so, have virtually no information. So I would just take them off. I don't want to meet every week and meet for four or five hours on this schedule that I don't even understand. I don't even know what's going on. Yeah, well, we might as well, I mean, might as well talk about this right now because I mean, I thought we had some valuable suggestions on, um, the, you know, mixed use buildings, um, you know, healthy discussion, and I thought you, you know, you took that in. So if we continue okay. our hearing with the CRC, are, are they? Does it even matter? Are they going to? Even, are that we going to be ignored? Or <laughs> it's like, are we actually going to stop the process if we continue why, why the hearing? Why do we have to do this? We don't have to meet. We don't have to have this hearing. We can decide as a board not to have it yet. If CRC wants to go ahead, you know, you know, I, this, this, you know, somehow on Monday it was represented to the town council that we were on board with these three bylaws revisions that we have never voted on, two of which we barely looked at. I don't know how we got here and why we're here. They're not done. 
you know, the, the mixed use building, we were talking about how it wasn't done, it wasn't ready. And on Monday, they were presented to the town council. And suddenly I'm on, you know, I, I just don't, I don't understand this process. And I'm not going to keep on saying four or five hour meetings every week, pushing, and we're not going to get the information we need. We're not going to do the analysis we need. We're not going to do our jobs. And we're not under this time pressure. Why are we here? You know, so not, where how about, is how about hearing, hearing from uh, some others on the planning board about this? Johanna, Maria, Tom. Do people know about uh, these? Johanna. I guess Johanna. I'll say um, it's, it's surprising to me, but I also understand the urgency. I don't think we started this in January. I think we started this in November. And um, I think CRC feels urgency. I think we all feel urgency to get this work done. That was kind of my sentiment at the last hearing, which was like, you know what? I think we're pretty close on the mixed use bylaw. Let's have a meeting in July and get to the point where we can move it forward. Um, so my guess is that CRC also feels that urgency and that's part of why they're trying to move quickly. And um, so, you know, I'm, Chris, I don't know enough about like, you know, Janet's point of have we done all the analysis? I feel like there's there's a lot of analysis out there. We have really talented planning staff. Um, you know, you all are getting ready for these hearings and are going to have things to say. I'm sure we'll have questions, but, um, you know, I, I kind of look to you um, to help guide us in this situation. Thank you, Johanna. Maria, your thoughts? You want Chris to answer? She's got her hand up. Chris, yeah. Thank you, Chris. I think we've done a lot of analysis and we're not really changing that much, particularly with regard to apartments. Um, and and y y we've taken out a lot of things that we had in previously that we we're wanting to um, talk to our consultant about because we're going to be hiring a consultant to deal with design guidelines. So. Um, the things that have to do with design, gu design guidelines and that are specific to different zoning districts, we've taken those out of these two, two really, um, zoning amendments. And the, the parking portion of it really just has to do with parking for mixed use buildings, parking for apartments and parking for accessory dwelling units. So those are the three, um, the three zoning bylaws that we've been studying a lot in the last few months. And so it's not a it's not an overhaul of the parking bylaw completely. It's just parking having to do with those three uses. And um, yeah, and I I feel like we're ready. I, I I really feel like we're ready to move on it. So you know, with one discussion on July fourteenth, I think you can certainly have a public hearing on July twenty first. And as I said, if you're not ready to vote on July twenty first, then you just continue the public hearing and, you know, have a, have a good discussion at another night. Um, so that's my recommendation. Um, Maria, please. Um, I, I, yeah, I really trust the planning staff, building staff, uh, the department staff to tell us what's best. And um, like everyone's been saying, this is not like the end, this is sort of the beginning of a conversation. So I have no problem diving right into it. I don't feel like this is like we're voting on it to approve it and it's done. I think that there's going to be a lot of work still ahead, but at least we're getting the, the gears in motion. Um, as far as the 4.30 to the 10.30 thing on 21st, um, I, I will be remote for most of the last few weeks of July. And so I, I hope that if we can get material early enough, I can review it and send my comments to Chris. That's why I emailed about being away because um, the time zone difference is just too big. So um, I, I'm fine reading material and sending it. And I hope that um, we can do this big push because the problem was, you know, 2020, everything stopped as far as building. And now everything is trying to get through the pipeline. And so the, the you know, the more we can help our town, you know, get back on its feet, I think the better. So 
I really appreciate the board, you know, putting in these extra hours every month. Um, and uh, I, I plan to, you know, send my comments or possibly uh, stay up in the wee hours and, and join in if I, I feel like it's um, critical. But um, I think we should push, you know, J July and August are hard, a lot of people are on vacation. So uh, as much as we can do for this critical time and our, our sort of transition from getting out of this pandemic, I think that's for the best. So Kyle, can you can you live with the 28th of July for? Uh, I if, correct me if I'm wrong, but the 21st is what was most recently being discussed. That's we have a joint hearing. That's Chris. We can't really change that at this point. Plus, we, we're just saying no. There's, you know, huge initiative to get through the bylaws. Um, I, I, I guess yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to advocate, Jack, for a project that has been in, you know, a long term land ownership for 50 years that we've been working for many years to get across the line. That We waited for leases to run out, that we were in a pandemic. Uh, the bylaw is changing as we after we've designed the building, we're trying to accommodate. We're trying to proceed forward so we can have a chance to open this thing on a schedule that works. So that we're an active project that will pay real estate taxes and will invest millions of dollars in downtown. If we could get in front of some conversations that could occur at a later date, I would greatly appreciate that. It would allow us to, you know, have a better chance of, of pulling this project off on a, on a timeline that would, that would work. Why don't we ask who's available on the 28th? I am. Jack? Doug thinks he is. Johanna, Tom. Are we meeting every Wednesday in July? Is that what we're committing to? Yes. Janet, not Marie. Maria, are you back by then? No. And then Andrew, probably. Should. Andrew, he's already had his vacation. He's got to get back to work. That's right. <laughs> so six of you are available to meet on the 28th. I think that's what we should do. So we'll do our best, Kyle, to make sure that uh, we have everything. And so hopefully we can close the hearing. I, I appreciate that. Um, like I said, I'm just trying to advocate. Obviously, the 14th would be better for us for this project that we're trying to bring forward. The 28th is the best. And we're a month between each project, each meeting. And it is what it is. Um, so I, I um um I, I think that's all i have to say okay thank you thank you for understanding all right so oh, somebody so needs to make a motion to continue the public hearing for all of these four public hearings to july 28th at whatever 6 30 6 35 yeah so moved second all right second doug Who's Tom? Tom moved and uh, Doug Tom. seconded. Uh, any discussion? How about we just raise hands? Good. Two, three, five. Is that six? Yeah, six. It looks like six. six. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks, Kyle, David. Thank you. All righty. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Yeah, you too. So going on to the next topic, old business, we've already kind of broached it a little bit, but um, was it with, the, I'm trying to remember with all these bylaws uh, mixing, but I just, you know, the planning board has, has skilled people and I would think the CRC would want to get some <laughs> some input um, prior to you know sending everything to it to um, you know join hearing I, I'm, I'm a little shocked by that but um, I 
I don't know. Um, it is what it is. So we've kind of talked, Janet. I mean, we've kind of talked this out already. I mean, I don't. I don't feel we have because it, it. It isn't what it is. It's what we, we're a planning board, and we can make decisions. Last Friday or Thursday, I talked to you about how I felt like you know we had eighteen zoning bylaw amendments. We had taken care of two or three. The planning department was putting some forward. We just started talking about mm -hmm. them. I felt like we need to get a schedule together, a process. We need to figure out what information we need early on. And because we're kind of asking the same questions and you thought that was a good idea. I sent that email to Christine saying, let's just put it on the agenda and let's get our handle around this. And then unbeknownst to me, the planning department and the town manager were bringing three zoning bylaw amendments to town council that I didn't even know what they are. I don't know what was brought to them. And the representation I, from what I've heard, I haven't watched the meeting yet, was that we had approved it. We were on board, we had discussed these things. I and think I, that was said, but then I retracted that. It was said by somebody else. And this is not the process that we agreed to with the CRC. And like Chris, didn't you think we might want a heads up? Like that we'd like to know as a planning board that this is happening. And then why do we have to schedule the, we have 65 days what what is going on i just i don't so, it's not the way we've worked and it doesn't matter that we have a new government we've been together for a couple of years and yeah why, we didn't why wouldn't you tell the planning board what you were doing like why we didn't get yeah i mean the problem is we didn't get through the agenda i don't even know what the amendments are what was taken out and i you know i just i put a lot of time into this and I know everybody else, you know, is holding down jobs and kids. I have the most free time and I'm overwhelmed by this. And I don't want to make decisions or hold hearings. It's not just holding a hearing, we have to make a recommendation. What possible recommendation can I make on a CVS parking lot when I know almost nothing about it? And how did that get scheduled without the planning board knowing? And the only reason we saw the bylaw, or what, it's not even a bylaw, it's like a you know, it's a paragraph is because I asked for it. I don't know, are we part of the process where we, we, you know, what, what is going on that no one's including us? Well, that came, to, that one came to the town council. It bypassed us. It came right to the town council and the town council referred it for a public hearing. To the planning board. To the planning board. And, and we didn't the, get it. What, what date was that? They referred it on May 24th. To hold a public and, hearing and you sent it out after i asked for it because i had heard about it from someone talking about it and we have 65 days to why is this an urgent rescheduling like what why is this on our schedule i have no information on a meeting of a, a hearing in seven days why weren't why isn't why aren't we part of this loop like why didn't you well, say this <clears throat> when i was sending my email i don't get it like, look at everybody, we're all here all the time. There's, yeah, there's a lot that's happening. Um, you know, if you want to know, I'm, I'm here almost all the time. I'm here at night. I'm just, um, there's just so much going on. And um, I apologize if I didn't communicate well enough with the planning board. Um, I, I guess I was thinking that you were kind of paying attention to what's going on with the town council and the CRC, but maybe that's not a reasonable expectation. And um, I tried to, I think I did let you know, as soon as you questioned me about that, you found out, you, you may have found out right after the um, referral for the CVS parking lot. And then you uh, reached out to me and I sent it out. And I think I sent it out to everybody at that time. Um, and we did meet with you on apartments and mixed use buildings. I can't remember the exact dates right now, but it's been, those things have been evolving since March. So um, I don't feel like this is coming out of the blue. The, the latest version of it may be, you know, the latest version that the CRC tweaked instead of the latest version that the planning board tweaked. But um, it seemed like it was those three things. Uh, no, those two things, um, apartments and mixed use buildings were, particularly mixed use buildings. So we're bouncing back and forth between the planning board and the CRC and the planning board and the CRC had different opinions about them. So the feeling was that it was really time to get the planning board and the CRC together to talk about them. And the way to do that is to have um, 
public hearing, and I, and that's what you'll be doing on the twenty first. So, um, I can um, Chris, so we you know, so we we tried to do this on the sixteenth, and we got bogged down with the mixed use buildings. Lots of good ideas, though, discussed, and so we punted on the apartments and uh, the parking. But you're saying that these are relatively easy lifts compared to the mixed use buildings the, the, like inclusionary zoning that we went through and i think apartments uh, is very easy there's there are hardly any changes one of the yeah. changes so that's that's people. that there's an upside there i think janet um but anyway it's 10 it's past 10 um you know maybe i can i can try to reach out to mandy and kind of see what's going on and uh, Mandy Joe, mm -hmm. and just kind of get a feel for what's going on with the, what, you know, the CRC is being, fa you know, is facing. Um, but at this point, can we, uh, I don't think we're going to accomplish anything more on this. Um, so let's just finish our agenda, I think. And, and uh, I know I got a lot of work tomorrow. Um, so new business. No new business. Okay. Form A and R subdivision no application. Form A's. You'll get one next week, I think. Okay. And the SPP, SPR, SUZ. No, we don't have any. New okay. Ones. I have. Uh, Actually, for... we do have a new one. We have a parking lot down on Bay Road, which is just a small parking lot for the. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Ellis Br uh, Brick Trail. I think I might yeah. have told you about that last time. Yep. So the uh, liaison reports of uh, committees, I have nothing from. Uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, uh, CPAC, Andrew's not here, Ag Commission, Doug. Yeah, exciting news on the Ag Commission. Uh, last month we had a, a quorum and I told you we, we voted a new chair. Uh, earlier this week, our new chair resigned from the commission. Oh. So the turmoil continues. Wow. Um, and Tom, you're meeting the 19th, we know. Yep, we did have a meeting about the Sweet Alice Trail, um, which we we're gonna talk about um, the trailhead, I think next week. Um, and now I'm, I'm actually blanking. I didn't get a chance to look at my notes what the other project we looked at. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> maybe Robert Chris remembers, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll share notes with that next meeting. And um, we've talked about the CRC already. I mean, I, I will, I'll reach out to Mandy and if I can kind of get some feedback and find out what the rationale was, but I know we did not, you know, we did not contribute. Can you talk um, to her about the process chart that we spent meetings talking about with them and what happened to that? Okay. And I'll send it around to the rest of us. So I can report that the CRC talked about the BL zoning district and the BL overlay the last time they met. Um, and the last time they met was June 8th. Is that right, Rob? No, June 22nd. They, they met on June 22nd and talked about the BL overlay mm -hmm. district. So they're, they're wanting to move ahead with that. And Mr. Okay. Marshall has his hand up. Doug. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at the flow chart that we've worked out with CRC in a number of months, but my recollection was it started with town council receiving a proposal and then referring it down for hearings. No, no. Well, well there's, multiple way, there's multiple ways that a proposal can end up with town council and they don't all go through us. So this could happen again Yes. You know, whether it's a citizen initiative or it comes from planning department or it comes from a town counselor, they can they can receive things that we've never seen and that their next act is to refer it to us for a hearing. I, I understand that. And um, I understand that's what happened Monday night when the planning department and town manager did that. But if you look at the, the chart that we agreed to with CRC, that's not the process that we're, how we work together and and how the planning department is supposed to go to the town council, discuss an issue, send it to CRC, planning board, we talk about it, we go back and forth. 
and then we go to we go back and it goes to hearing. I mean, it's just it'd be nice if we followed that chart. But if we're going to get like a new, I mean, one of my questions was like, what's coming next week? And we can't do it. We're doing a, we're going to do a crummy job on this stuff. I mean, we don't have the information like changing apartments from 24 units per building to an unlimited number, taking away parking spaces. This affects the RG. It affects every district that apartments are, you know, I mean, it's just, this is like, what is it going to look like? We're, we have no design standards. Um, we can just have a lot of boxy apartments all over town. Wouldn't we like to know that? And I know the planning department can give it to us, but not under the conditions that they're functioning under. And I don't understand why. I mean, I don't, I don't want to make Chris work every night. I don't want us to meet every week. There's some kind of urgency. It might be an election, but that's not my urgency. And I don't think it's the planning boards, you know. Let's do a good job on what we have and, and take our time with it. I mean, and well, you know, everybody has jobs, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, again, I, I, it may not be as bad as we're making it out, Janet. So we'll just, we'll, we'll you know, stay with the program and just, and, you know, and if it's, if it's, you know, a ridiculous proposition, then I think at that point, again, we could continue the hearing and take the time that we need to understand it and give our feedback. So. They could also hold the hearing without us and we can have a separate hearing. I don't think that's inconceivable. True. Doug, is your hand still up? No. Okay. All right. So let's let's uh, adjourn here. We'll report to staff. I mean, you have anything more? <laughs> Too much work. Hey, right. Yeah, many things going on. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Well, everyone have a great evening, and and we'll see y'all next week. And thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 Where's my hand? There it is. <laughs>